Hello, everybody. Welcome. Are we live? Welcome. Are we? Sounds like we are. How's it going, everybody? How is it going? I guess we should officially go live, make our little announcement from the correct account this time. How about that? Huh? How about that? Peace. And this is just going to be compiler part 10. And we're going to be doing functions. Sure, why not? Make sure to add the proper group. And we are off. We are live. We are officially live. How is it going? All right. Yes, yes. Today we will be working on our compiler some more. As we do. And as one does. I, uh... Hey, V me! Ooh, that welcome screen. I dig it. Awesome. Thank you, V me. Hey, Simon the Swede. Hello, compiler maker number one. Love. Oh, you're the best, guys. Thank you so much. How are you guys doing? Thank you for tuning in. How's it going, V me? How's it going, Simon? Hey, <laughs> Simon the Swede says your logo reminds me of the Half-Life logo. It is it is exactly the same logo, pretty much. It's a lambda. It's a lowercase lambda, which is a, a letter. So it is, it, is, it is definitely inspired by the Half-Life logo, because I played Half-Life and Half-Life 2. <laughs> Simon the Swede gives three pog champs. That's worth like 18 schmeckles <laughs> in reply to Simon, or in reply to V-Me, saying, Simon, hello, <laughs> with the dancing cat. So amazing. Half-Life 2 is probably my favorite game of all time. It's very much up there. It's, a, it's, it's such a good game. I played through it like this year, <laughs> just again. Like, it's so good. I kind of want to start speed running it. I just don't have enough time. There's already so many tricks and things. I'd have to like create a new category if I wanted any hope. <laughs> I got to watch when my grandpa played it when I was little. <laughs> I can't tell if that's a dig. At... <laughs> I can't tell if you're calling me old or if I'm just uh, an old head. <laughs> No, but that's really sweet that you got to watch your grandpa play it. Your grandpa played video games? That's pretty dope. Or plays? I don't want to say. I don't want to assume. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. All right. The name of the game today. Hey, good mallard shows up. Hey, oh. Vimi said, oof, a chill wind of my age just blew right in my back. <laughs> exactly. Simon the Swede says, no, for real. He was an IT teacher back in the day. I feel old. <laughs> I'm 19 and I feel old. Vimi says, hello to Good Mallard. Good Mallard, how is the compiler going? Well, oh, I don't have the build thing set up, but it's going well. Build is not a directory. Is it debug? Wait, what did I call it? Where's the seam? Oh, I'm in source. Look at me being silly. It builds. And we'll pass it. Simple. I need to use a backslash because of Windows. And there we go. CMake isn't cooperating. Oh no. <laughs> Every time I think CMake isn't cooperating, it's always just me being a dummy. <laughs> me going, oh yeah, I did do that wrong. <laughs> uh. 
So this is, you asked, somebody asked. Okay, Good Mallard asked, how is the compiler going? This is how it's going. We, uh, we can parse this program into this. And then we, uh, we pretend to generate code, but we do not. <laughs> Simon the Swede says, my grandpa's hobby is to do server stuff that I can't explain. That's why he has three old Windows computers. Oh lord. Vimi asks, pre-make or sharp make though, Craigasm? <laughs> oh no. Oh no. No, Vimi. Good Mallard says hi to Vimi. Vimi says at Simon. Not old, it's called vintage. <laughs> That's right. Pay respect. <laughs> it's not old, it's vintage. It's antique. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Simon says true, true. Okay. So yeah, we can parse this into this AST. And we pretend to generate code, but we do not. So uh, we can actually start doing that. I believe, right? So let's think about how our code gen should work. I feel like each one of these should be in its own file. Just to keep things as clean as possible. Because code gen should, I mean, it's going to be different every time. How could we do this? So, you call it abacus, I call it cash register of my childhood. <laughs> Lamau. <laughs> Vimi, you are hilarious. <laughs> oh. How are you doing, good mallard? Thank you for tuning in. I very much appreciate it. We are going to work on code gen and parsing functions today. Hopefully we get some fun stuff happening. So maybe we'll just keep this here for now. We'll just, we'll, we'll be the bad guy. So. This seems rational in assembly, because if I wanted a variable of a certain size, I would just do this. So a, a global variable will just be a memory address, aka a label in assembly, a memory address, where we have allocated space in the executable. Vimi says, are we getting functions? God damn. <laughs> Good Mallard says, I'm doing good. How about you? Uh, I'm doing okay. I just woke up a little tired this morning, but we are going to get through it. Thank you for asking, Good Mallard. I'm glad you're doing good. <laughs> Vimi, are we getting functions? God damn. That would be ideal, because I know, I think I've thought, thought it through in my head a little bit, which is rare for me. Keep track of identifier somehow. How about we just go C style and use the variable identifier as the assembly identifier because the compiler is lazy. How about we do that? Hmm? <laughs> hmm? So what do we do? What is this? Let's, let's make this a little clearer because this is a little confusing like with the temp node naming because we can't allocate uh, stack variables in a switch case in C. So this is going to be get type of variable from variables context using variable ID, symbolic ID. <laughs> Vimi says, lazy? I call it optimizing my life for sleep. <laughs> Legendary, exactly. <laughs> uh, get um type info of type from types context using type symbol ID. Type symbol ID. Sounds 
sounds logical, doesn't it? <laughs> and then for now, we're just printing this node. Yeah, handle nested scopes, whatever. So we print this node, which has a type ID of the node itself, I believe. Like this is a value. So this type ID refers to integer in our case. Let's look at actually parser probably has print node for some reason. So yes, we just switch on node type and compare it to the known types. So eventually we will have to look up this type. See, the type of the node, if it's user-defined, we may have to uh, have like a default case that handles user-defined. I don't know. We'll figure out how that works. Or we could use the types environment. It's not a bad idea. In any case, we need this data, the size of the actual type, so that we know how many bytes in the global variable declaration to actually save. So I believe <laughs> Landar XT, what's up? How's it going? He says, for once, I actually didn't see the notification the second you sent it. <laughs> it's uh for those of you who don't know, Landar XT is always here, like at the very beginning of streams. It's incredible. <laughs> oh, and apparently Nolan is too. Heyo, Nolan says, hey, hey, with a happy face. How's it going, Nolan? So I think after right, we need a buffer to write realm. That would be a string, would it not? Interesting. We're going to do this. We're going to have a little helper here. Probably going to have to be in its own file eventually. But we're going to say, what does f error return an integer? f error. What does f error return? I'm an idiot. What does f write return? Okay, and this is going to be like f write bytes or whatever. We're going to need a, a char pointer, bytes, and a file pointer, stream or whatever, file, right? And then you can get the length, this, we'll call it a byte string, how about that? We get a byte string, and then we would like to just f write from byte string, uh, one byte at a time, length bytes, into file. And I think we just return that. It's an unsigned int. Nolan says, or okay, so Vimi says, hello, Landar. He gets a dancing cat. Amazing. Nolan gets an ahoy with a, <laughs> a very awesome uh, emote of Victor, Brahmi. And then Vimi says, you guys excited for a weekend? Absolutely. Going to do nothing this weekend. No, it's probably busy for me. I wish I could do nothing. Nolan says, you inspired me to start streaming. Been doing some work on stream today. Nolan says, hey, Vimi. And then Nolan says, I'm very excited for the weekend. I am now on holiday for the next week, going away for my anniversary. That's awesome, Nolan. You've got a lot of stuff going on that's positive. That's really sweet. Good Mallard says, actually have to go already. Good luck with the stream. All right. Thank you, Good Mallard. Thank you for tuning in. We love you. We appreciate you. Vimi says, ooh, sounds great. <laughs> that is awesome. That's cool that Nolan started streaming. N-U-L-L-U-N. Hey. Landar says, at Nolan, followed you. hey oh, we are networking. <laughs> So I think this allows me to write simply a string to a file, much simpler, without having to worry about it. 
what do I call it? Out? Code? Something like that. Okay. We got to think about our actual header and what we should generate first in the file. Should also have like Uh, that's a little too much work. I don't want to do it. I want to deal with the errors. Well, we can do it. Screw it. All we have to do is say, uh, equals this, return f right. If status does not equal zero, I think that's how that works. Turn status. I think that's how we would do that. Hey, oh, Vimi says, following the lead of my Sith Lord at Lander XT. <laughs> awesome. Vimi and Landar have went and followed Nolan, it sounds like. He says, for reference, I do low-level assembly-like smart contract development and reverse engineering. That sounds very complicated. That's awesome. I don't think I'm that smart. <laughs> like, uh, how do you... So, how do you do assembly-like smart contract development? That kind of breaks my head. Is it like WebAssembly? Because isn't a smart contract... Like online? Am I misunderstanding what a smart contract is? So we need a file. We would like to write in the code. And let's just write like our header. Right? At the at the top. Maybe we could even do a constant. That's not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea at all. This is terrible, by the way. We're gonna have to fix this code up, but it's fine. And this is going to be um, code jam header. Sure, why not? And this is literally just going to be a string that says like this file is generated by the fun compiler. To do actually name the compiler and the language. That's probably important. I probably shouldn't just be in codegen.c, but it's fine. <laughs> Vimi says, this isn't terrible. It's just sub-perfect. That's right, just sub-optimal. Could be better. <laughs> By the fun compiler. Sure, I think that's all we need. We could put a version in here. But uh, we're not there yet. That would have to be using like preprocessor definitions. And so I think we could just put another string here and it'll add to the end. So if we have a macro, which is our uh, version number, then we should just be able to change the macro. Ooh, Nolan gives an amazing chat message in response to my question. Smart contracts are compiled down to bytecode, just like normal applications, but they run inside virtual machines on distributed hardware. That's the bit. Think the JVM, but on thousands of computers. You can write in higher level languages, but I like to pull the bytecode off the chain, disassemble it, and look for vulnerabilities. So, Nolan says, sorry, we'll stop talking about it now. This is your stream. <laughs> You're right. But that's very interesting. So you basically have a virtual machine with distributed computing power. Kind of like a botnet, but not as not malicious, is the idea. That's really cool. Vimi says, finally, my fiber is back, and I can appreciate the stream on my ultra-wide monitor. Hey, that's Pog. Yeah, we don't, we don't have fiber in this city yet. It's terrible. It's suboptimal, subperfect. <laughs> so we're just going to have that. I think this is fine. What did I just call that? 
here's my goldfish memory. Gold gem head up. What's Yoshi? Oh, it's not a it's a const. Landar XT says Java runs on three billion devices. <laughs> the kappa. The kappa in that statement is so hard. The sarcasm. <laughs> not at once. <laughs> Push QRDX, how's it going? Thank you for tuning in. How are you? Uh, how are you doing? Can't it also be malicious? I mean, what's preventing a huge virtual machine running arbitrary code from running malicious code? <laughs> Nothing stops the VM from running malicious code, even though it's big. But I'm sure they have. Uh, He's just debugging the application that he's building, the smart contract that he's running, if that makes sense. So let's think about what we actually need. Also, let's try and compile this. Yeah, I figured. So strlen, implicit direct, <laughs> implicit declaration. We need string.h. I'm a silly boy. That was it. Okay, so now we should be able to go to code.s. Not that one, I guess. This code.s. Hey, look at us. And then we just have to make sure to write the uh, comment character for the assembly, the generated code. Look at us. Our assembler is taking shape. Not our assembler, but our assembly code, <laughs> our code gen for assembly. So we would like the identifier. What's the variable identifier? I think we have that in the variable declaration. It's a child. So if we look at our AST, Yes. If we look at our AST, our variable declaration, the first child is actually our symbol. So to get our ID, all we have to do is access our current node, which is called expression, children, value in the symbol ver uh, place of the union. I think we're going to do something like that. And if we take a look at this code, whoa, I hid Emacs on accident. There we go. Look at us. This is, this is good. So at some point we'll just have this be a, a line, obviously. Okay. Look at us. Didn't we write line here? Should this not be a new line? I guess we should check our status. Right. So if our status is non zero. We should like print F error. We're just going to put that in a to do and say failed to write bytes or something. Good enough, right? And then we can say to code file to, eh. we'll just say failed to write bytes. Return error. Oh, I guess this can be an error prep. Or error create. Oh, we have prep. We have error. We need like a file error. So to do, yeah, to do. Fair. <laughs> we can steal this, whoops, steal this message. And then just return it. And kind of... Copy that all the way down. 
That was the right line. <laughs> Landar says, when someone tries to install the JVM, it gets deleted for someone else, so it stays exact. Right at 3 billion. Lamau Landar. <laughs> Vimi responds to push and says, what's preventing your home PC from running a root kit? Any hardware can run anything. <laughs> Vimi. <laughs> you being that guy. Push Q or DX responds to deep. And then Vimi says to Landar, you are the perpetrator who deletes my JVM. <laughs> I like how, uh, how official that sounds. Okay, we got, uh, we got no errors, but we got a confusing, a confusing file, right? A very confusing file. It doesn't have our code gen header, which is kind of confusing. We're past the file. We write into the file. I think this makes sense. This is a string, so it has a null terminator. Hello? What did I do? No errors. <laughs> That's no good. If code compiles first try, it's never a good sign. Lamau, v me, you are hilarious. <laughs> You're right, though. There's, there's some issue here. At push QRDX. We need Mr. Holmes on that case immediately. <laughs> That's right. And this returns an error, I presume. Yes, error prep. Okay. Just gonna steal that then. Where where? Hello? Hello. And this is gonna say could not. I think we can just say return error because it's already prepped here. So we can kind of make this much more concise. Okay, still no errors. Still no still no data in the file. Wonderful. We messed it up royally. What have we done? Oh shit, what have I done? <laughs> so we can write from the byte string that we are given, the address, one byte at a time, length bytes, into file. And this writes one byte into the file, a new line. This doesn't seem that insane, right? I know I'm getting something very simple wrong here, and I just, I feel very dumb. What is it? You are a cogen header. That works. It worked before. Why would you not write? The string length is not going to be different. <laughs> PushQRDX says, Holmes is a busy man. I heard he took an eternal vacation and never came back. Watson is still looking for him. That's some super villain type <laughs> dialogue right there my man damn so we do f close so we should flush all of our data i see we don't return error from here where did i just error prep i think i may be dumb status, it would still return OK, right? So I could error that. Error. Error generic. Do not write bytes. We still get no errors. <laughs> so if we did return error and status was non-zero, so these are all non-zero. We just don't uh, get them. <laughs> okay, let's think about this. So maybe I'm not 
responding to the error here. Oh, look. My bubbling. My bubbling didn't work. Failed to write bytes. Okay. That's this. So this fails. F write bytes fails. Let's figure it out. We get a length. It's the string length of byte string. That should be four, right? So we write one byte four times from this array, this memory address, into file. I don't see how something this simple could go so wrong. Maybe if write does not return an error value, and I'm uh, very stupid. Does it return the amount of bytes it writes? Oh, it does. Okay, look, this is why we need man. So, <laughs> we don't have man pages. What do we have? We have info. I don't think I'll have a C library info. So we just got to look at the internet. Gotta look at F right. Welcome everybody to the internet. We're going to take a look at F right. Yeah, it returns a size T. That's actually the total amount of amounts. The total amount of elements written. Okay, so I actually have to say this is a size T. We're just going to say this size T. Uh, and this is going to be written. It's written. Look at me being silly, forgetting the return value of F right. <laughs> Vmes at pushqrdx. Then we need the next best thing. Inspector gadget. Dun -dun -dun -dun. <laughs> Lander XD says your business partner took a. How should I explain it to you? An eternal vacation. <laughs> pushqrdx says yep. Lamal. Vme says at Lander XT doesn't mean to keep his share of the company. Kappa. Lander XT. I have taken that matter into my own hands. <laughs> Vimi says at Landar, expect my cat ninja assassin squad to pay you a visit. And Landar says, I shan't be concerned. Things are popping off in the chat. <laughs> so funny. You guys are so awesome. <laughs> we have like a Bond villain. We'll just do this. But not right fine. And it's gonna be just a new narrative for now. Return air. Return okay if we get to the end. Return air if we get here. And then say bytes written equals this. And then do that thing again. And I believe that's done it. Could not write bytes. Vimi says one million followers. <laughs> followers? Ooh, I'm in tree. Push QRDX says Agent 007 versus <laughs> Watson. That would be awesome. A James Bond goes back in time to deal with Sherlock Holmes. That would be pretty sweet. Vimi says, I mean, 007 wears Omega. You can't top that. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's got a point. <laughs> Alrighty. This makes sense, I believe. Also, I, I don't I don't think I need to initialize to zero. It's kind of just useless. That's old C code. Okay, yes. Now the problem is status equals we can do air. And then we can say 
if error, return error. Much simpler. Don't have to deal with much. There's not duplicate error codes. Hopefully. <laughs> okay, I didn't replace all of them yet. That's why. So then we just say error. And I just have it. I didn't apparently. Vimi says, have you seen the 50th anniversary moon landing Omegas? They are so sexy. I have not. <laughs> Landar says, followers are the new currency of the United Republic of Lenzer. Fallers. <laughs> F-O-L-L-A-R-S. You know, fallers. I like fallers. <laughs> That's so silly. PushQRDX says, directly linked to Twitch. That's right. Directly linked to the Twitch stock. <laughs> Hey, we're back and hopefully in action. Hey, look at us. We're doing it. We're doing the thing. Okay. And then this has to be a number. So we have to write an integer and convert it into a string. Does anybody remember how to do that? Is it A to a, a to string? Uh, a to I? That takes in a string. I to A? It's I toa, isn't it? It's got to be I toa. But that writes into a given buffer. Is that what we have to do? Do we have to... Uh, that's annoying. <laughs> so we can use I toa. And this should convert an integer into an array with a given radix, which is just a base, a number base. Vimi says, sound, oh, Landar says, once you get affiliate and channel points, please rename them to fallers. <laughs> I'll see if I can. Vimi says, sounds like an anti-utopian story about the U.S. going the way of communism. Fallers are the new currency. <laughs> Vimi asks, what do you want to cast? Wit. Uh, I'm trying to write a string, write a byte string into a file. So I think I'm going to actually write a helper that just is fwrite number. And then I just want to give it a number. And what is this number? I think it's next child value integer, right? Okie dokie. We'll just have it write integer. Why not? And when we write this integer, it's going to be a long, long. That's our integer type. So this is going to be our integer. Hopefully we can just type that. I'm going to have a file to write into. We should say, if not file, return error. Yeah, good enough. I'm gonna do the same thing here. Say f write integer. Could not write integer. I'm very fancy with these these error messages. Also, file is all caps. Okay, so now this integer, how big can a long long get? Does anybody know? Ooh, push QRDX says asks so long long. Yes, yes. Landar XT says long. <laughs> That's how long a long long is. Ooh. <laughs> a long long on x8664 is eight bytes. Vimi says, by the way, guys, if we're all on Discord, how do you feel about a micro code jam or something? I don't know what that is, but it, it sounds cool. 
go for it. I'll create a custom channel for you if you want to like do a whole thing or I don't know what it entails. What is a micro code jam? Do we all code at like the same time? <laughs> it sounds insane. I've never made code jam before. <laughs> oh, I'm an idiot. I have been streaming for just about 40 minutes now. I'd like to thank everybody so much for watching. We are going to continue. I'd just like to point out that there is the Discord link down below. Check that out if you haven't already. And uh, come get announcements every time I go live. And uh, come have fun. We're, we might have a micro code jam, according to VME. And uh, we all have a lot of fun, so I really recommend it. There's also the YouTube if you want to check out any previous VODs, any previous broadcasts. And then there is also the donate button. If you would be so generous uh, to give a few dollars, I have no other source of income, but or, so I would greatly appreciate any and all uh, incoming donations. But it is not required. All that is required is for you to be here and be positive. And uh, that's it. I'll love you. Anyways, we can now get back to writing an integer into a file. PushQRDX says, long, long can get stupidly big. I don't know, something maybe trillions or bigger. It's a huge mo number, can't remember it. Lander X <laughs> says, well, it is a long, long. <laughs> so funny. You're right. Long, long is eight bytes, but it's a signed integer. So I don't know if you know this, but uh, numbers are stored in binary on computers. And eight bytes is... Uh, 64. Here, how do I do this? That didn't work. Uh, how do I just type the number zero? I don't know. We're just going to type the number sign. Anyways, all of these could either be one or zero, right? But one bit here in a signed number is actually denoted to whether it's signed or not. The rest actually contain the value of the number in binary. So what we can do is effectively the biggest this number could be is if this were all ones. And if this were all ones, then that means the number system, the binary, all of these exponents would be added together. So 2 to the, uh, the blah, 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 blah. They'd all be added together. And you end up with 2 to the 63, right? Because there are 63 bits here. And they have two possibilities in each one. I think that's, the, uh, that's the, how we do that. So if we calculate 2 to the 63, let's just open up eShell. Can I do Python within eShell? Will that break things? Does anybody know? I think it does break things. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to kill Eshell. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, how can we get the power? I guess we're just gonna have to use like a web calculator. We are not doing well. Oh, I could. Uh, here. Let me just use the terminal. This is much easier. I have it open. Push QRDX has the answer. Nine, ooh, <laughs> nine something. <laughs> that number. We'll see if we get that. So two to the 63, is that how we do this? I don't think that's how we do this. I think it's two. In new shell, can you do math? I think you can. I'm just gonna enter Python either way. Two to the 63 is a very large number. And this last bit, the 64th bit, means that we can have a positive or negative of this number. So however long this number is, how long is this number? Uh, does anybody know? Just doing a little Python here, sorry. It's 19. <laughs> Landar XT writes it out. We never answer questions because it's funnier when you do something wrong. Ooh, <laughs> that hit me right in the feels, man. 
Lander XT says 9 quintillion 223 quadrillion 372 trillion 36 billion 854 million 775 thousand 807. That's pretty impressive. Nice. I don't know how you did that. Can you do that in your head or did you use a, a program for that? Because that's insanity. Anyways, we have this number now and it's 19 uh, characters long. So all we have to do is effectively create a buffer that says number that's 20 characters long. Let's make it 21 just in case, right? And then we can just say memset number. We'll do this. We'll just do a size t because it's an array. And this number is going to be max width max string width equals 21 sure let's do that so then we would like to set the string yeah, I think we can just do string width make our lives a little easier set it to all zeros. So this is all null terminators now. So we have 20 bytes in a row that are null terminators. But after zeroing it out, what we can do is say, also we're probably, we can't return, uh, we're going to have to all allocate this, are we not? We are. And just like that, it's allocated. That was hard. Okay. So we're going to return. And then we're going to. Oh, I guess, uh, hey, I was, it doesn't have to be allocated. Look at me getting ahead of myself. It doesn't have to be allocated because we're not actually returning this string. We're writing the string into a file and then returning whether we succeeded or not. So we can use a local buffer. Look at me. So I need adle. So this should be, that would be array to long long, but we need long long to a. Does anybody remember what that is? It's not I do I, is it? Let's take a look. So we're going to take a look at C library. LL2A. That's sort of what I need. So these are just integers. Yes. L2A. So there is LTOA. But I can't click on it. Okay, this website is very slow. I do, <laughs> I do not like it. But in any case converts long to a string. Is there no long long to string? That would be kind of crazy. I'm pretty sure there's a long long to string. Aloha. Lander XT said I googled it for the number earlier, by the way. Push Kiro DX says Lamal. Moralilu says Aloha. How's it going, Moralilu? What brings you into the compiler stream today? How are you doing? number 10. I think we're writing decimal numbers. We could write hexadecimal numbers, right? But we have to put a uh... we'll just say write integer for now and keep it decimal. Moralilu says, I'm just here in between meetings at work. Awesome. I'm so glad you could show up. Thank you, Moralilu. Push QIDX says plot twist. Aloha is the function to convert long long to string. <laughs> Push, that was hilarious. <laughs> Turns out, all we gotta do is call Aloha. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So it looks like LL2A. My intuition was correct, but we're we're not finding it. Sprintf? 
we can use sprintdef. In fact, if we use sprintdef, we could even use the like VF, uh, VF printf with a null to figure out our actual length that we need. It doesn't matter. We're just going to use sprintf. Look at me completely forgetting about sprintf. So we're going to write number. We're going to write integer into number with the format of LLB. Look at us. Yes. Can't believe I forgot sprintf. That's ridiculous. I feel bad. <laughs> Landor XT says, what do you think about long, long, long? Actually, isn't that a Beatles song? Lamau. <laughs> long, long, long. I think we got to start figuring out how to rename things. Like maybe we just name it long. You know what I mean? We start there. And then we have long, long. You know what I mean? And then it converts into long again. I don't know. I think long, long, long would be a little too much. I think long, long is already too long. <laughs> Hey, Eternal Wild Fox says, hello, he is back at it again. It's so good to see you, Eternal. How's it going? So buffer format integer. That's a long. Okay, so now this thing. Also, this could be static, right? Is that okay? I think that's fine. Variable length array folded to constant array as an extension. Cool. That's very cool. So this const, because it's const, it, this really just means read only. It's not constant. So this read only variable, it goes, okay, this, we're treating it as a constant, as an extension, the GNU extension. I could just do that as well to avoid this whole dilemma. And I think sprintf writes a null terminator, hopefully. We could get rid of this. We could try efficiency <laughs> or laziness depends on which one you prefer lander xt says my proposal just call it a very long that's actually a good idea <laughs> push qrdx says genius number of l's how long it is <laughs> i mean that's already how th this works like it's a long long decimal num long long decimal format so why not just have long 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 you know <laughs> So now this string, we would like to actually write it into the file we're given. And we would like to say error equals that and return error. All right. Variably modified number at file scope. fright int string width buffer size why not we'll just we'll have the most verbose of names don't tell me that you can't do this plus one <laughs> please expected expression odd okay that's not what I want that was a weird language server thing there. So we're just going to do buffer size as 21. Why are you mad? Oh, it equals. Is that Was that the whole issue? That was probably the whole issue. That was the whole issue. I was like, what is going on? This makes a lot more sense. Um, so this f right buffer size. I mean, it, we never need to actually use it. So I think we can just have it 21 and not be an issue. And if we take a look, hey, <laughs> that's incorrect, but hey, we did it. <laughs> uh. Eternal Wild Fox says, doing good. I am trying to get an abstract syntax tree. Nice. We, uh, we also are doing that today. We're going to work on functions in a little bit. And right now we're working on some very basic global variable declarations in the code gen part.
Lander XT says, is there any need for anything longer, though? <laughs> Do we need a very long, long? A very, very long? Eternal Wild Fox says, but I am working on a math expression engine. S still, it is complex, lol. Yeah, math expression, depending on what kind of parsing you do. I think Pratt parsing is very simple once you understand the gist of it. And if you use, like, continuations, Pratt parsing becomes very simple. There's not even recursion in it. It's just like, oh, this is easy. But it's still a, a complex thing to wrap your head around for the first time. It's kind of like a, a, a very steep learning curve, right? PushQRDX says, yeah, complex and floats need more for more accuracy. Okay, then make the very long, extremely long, and massively long. <laughs> Mora Lilu says, ASTs are cool. My AST is just JSON. Oh, Christ. Vimi says, heretic. And then Eternal Wild Fox says, yeah, I'm new to it. You're, we're all new at some point. We gotta start somewhere, right? So we're getting the wrong number. But we are currently writing an integer. That's amazing. I should have like an error check macro. F write integer. So yes, very wrong. Wonderful. So if we take a look at our expression, that's incorrect. We should be using our temp node. You see? You see? Okay, and we exited with code 5. Because it probably doesn't have a next child. Hey! Bog! Look at us. I know it's not that impressive, but... We are officially using our type system in environments and parsing context to actually generate code based on a program that we wrote. We declared A as an integer and B as an integer in the global scope, which means that they get defined as global variables, and they are actually being defined. This is beautiful. This is beautiful, beautiful. Vimi says giga long, terra long. <laughs> That's actually sweet too. It's not wrong, it's just below correctness threshold. That's right. <laughs> okay. This is quite a verbose way of writing things, but uh, we don't have... This is the best file streaming we can do in C, right? <laughs> this is pretty cool. We need to put this in the proper section, right? I think that's quite important. So we're going to have error. Data section. We're going to need a file. And I think we're just going to take everything. I don't know if we need the program. Probably just the context, right? Because, truthfully, couldn't we just loop over this environment? Because we're just finding all the top-level variable declarations, but we've already done that while parsing and created the variables table. We can just loop over the variables table in the context. So this is going to be node pointer variable symbol variable name to type equals I don't know node allocate yeah this will be our shell and then we'll free it at the end and it will fill with all sorts of things it will fill with all sorts of things we are actually doing code gen look at us in a way that isn't too insane so we do have to split it up into multiple files, which we could probably help ourselves with, with some of these. That was too many. 
and we'll have like end file helpers and begin file helpers. And this will help us when we go to split the file up into multiple pieces. Right, then here we can have begin x86 64 AT and P assembly. Perfect. Then we can just have an end. And that's good enough for me for now. <laughs> v me. Lenzer's GF. Does he love me? Lenzer's thoughts at the same moment. I have to make functions and scope work <laughs> and scopes work and fun compiler. See, you assume I want a relationship in the first place. <laughs> uh, but you're right. That is what my mind is doing all the time. I don't uh, care for mortal beings. <laughs> my GF. Do I exist? Me at the same time. No. <laughs> that was really funny, Linda. <laughs> Because it's true. I don't have a GF. I don't want one. Too much work. Too much work. Which is selfish, but I don't care. It's not like I need to have a family. I already have, like, family. I have parents. Right? I think that's family enough. I don't need, like, kids just to have more family. So... We would like to, to do generate code. No shit. <laughs> so we would like to generate the data section just after opening the file. Okay, and let's think about this. We kind of want to say while how do we, is, do we have any way to iterate an environment? Let's think about this. So an environment is actually just binding in parents. So if we had, what if we just had a binding? Here, let's have our node pointer variable name to type, right? But then we're going to have our binding pointer, and this is going to be our iterator, equals this. That was really loud. Hopefully that uh, doesn't screw with the audio too much. I would like to uh, take a quick moment, thank everybody for watching. If you enjoy what you're seeing, be sure to hit that follow button, check out the links down below, Discord, the PayPal donate, the uh, YouTube, whatever you prefer. We are so close to Twitch affiliate. We're meeting every single requirement except for the 50 followers. So as soon as we get 50 followers, y'all will be getting channel points. Y'all will be able to cheer. Y'all will get custom emotes. It's going to be sweet. So I really recommend hitting that follow button. And uh, let's continue hitting that uh, code can. Making that data section. Yeah. V me. Me after work. I'm gonna go to a hackerspace and do a small code jam. My friend. Yeah, and I will go raise my child, take care of stuff with the house we are building, and stuffs. <laughs> v me says, oh yeah, hardcore social life. <laughs> Lamau. Landar says, it wouldn't be morally right to make eight more accounts to follow you, right? I'm just gonna say, I wouldn't judge you. <laughs> Twitch may judge you, but I wouldn't judge you. I think it would be a lot of work, and I don't think you have to put that much work in. All you gotta do is watch. People will, people will come. <laughs> Vimi says, morality? It's relative, mate. Kappa. <laughs> Lamal. Hey, look, we're doing linked list iteration. How do you... How do you iterate a hash table? Do you have to check? Do you have to check every single bucket for values? You probably do, huh? That sucks. <laughs> so iterating a hash table might even be slower than O of n, because there n is the amount in the in the hash table. So if you store ten things in the hash table, but there's ten thousand buckets to iterate it, do you have to iterate ten thousand buckets? That sounds terrible. Landor XT says, even KFC chicken buckets? 
Well, you can think of it like that. You can think of it like that. And each piece of chicken is an object in a linked list. <laughs> okay, so we have a node pointer for our ID. And we have a node pointer type symbol, type ID, right? So then the idea would be to generate the code. We'll basically just do this. I think I just can copy paste. We're going to copy paste. It's not recommended, but we're going to. So get type symbol ID. So get type symbol of variable from variables context using variable symbol ID. So this would be interesting. So the type ID has to transfer into some node. So do we have to allocate a node here? I think we may have to. And we're literally just going to have the same thing, temp node one. We can probably name it something better since this is specific. So this is actually going to be type info, right? See, this would be looking up the variable to get the type symbol, but we have already done that. So we need to get the type info from the types context using our type symbol. So our ID would be our type ID but we have to get into some node, see? And this node that we're getting into has to be allocated, and then freed, but not node freed, because node free would free its children, which actually refers to the data here. Vimi says, please don't check my trash bucket. And then, is that sleepy Pepe? Woke Pepe? <laughs> If bucket owner equals be me, continue. <laughs> Lamau. So we need to write, write identifier corresponding to variable. Pass through literally for now. We'll just put that on a new line so it looks beautiful. Why not? So we are actually going to have the var ID value symbol. And then here, this is going to be the type info. We get the child, which is the size of the type as an integer. We write that integer. If person equals stupid, print you are Lander XT. Aw, no, Landar. You're not stupid. We all make stupid mistakes. That doesn't make us stupid. Hey, look, we did it. And we do it in reverse. Why not? So now we can remove all this nonsense. And uh, we can just basically skip these. <laughs> look at us. Look at this amazing code gen. Look at this incredible code generator. It's it's monumental. <laughs> okay, so at the top, we're going to have to write um, what is it? I think dot section dot data because these are all global mutable variables, and we're going to write that into the code file. And we can actually write that as a line. It's pretty good to me. You made so many stakes in VME, you spelled it like Lander XT. <laughs> Lamal. If we if you are sitting here watching somebody make a compiler, you're definitely not stupid. 
right? You definitely have a yearning for the beyond. <laughs> You're not just like a snake sitting in the sun, right? You assigned stupid to person. <laughs> Nolan pointing out that he didn't use the equality operator. He used the assignment operator, the single equals, which is hilarious. I have an earning for an old fashioned. <laughs> Vimy is just <laughs> slowly becoming more and more of an alcoholic. Please no. So in this section, we write the data. In this section, we write the code. Hey, we did that to do. What am I? I hate when I do a function call and then treat it like a function definition. I don't even know what I'm thinking. It's not text. Yes. So then in the dot text section, we're going to be generating So we have a section dot text, right? And within that section, we're going to need probably the start label. And yeah. I think that's how we're going to have to do that. Or we could have, we could like code gen the actual program node itself in this way, but I don't think it matters. Vimi says more of an alcoholic. There's more? <laughs> Lamau. Oh no, no. <laughs> Lander XT says, what if I was using Landar++, my non-existent language? <laughs> Nolan is a face bomber. Not like this. <laughs> the not like this emote. I like that. This is starting to look like assembly, boys. This ain't looking so this ain't looking so bad. Um top level program footer. header. So the header, also we should implement like a structure, a code gen structure. Okay, well I'm going to put this in the to-do because this is going to take a second to think about. So I would like to add, make code gen structure with function pointers and such. This would allow each implementation to actually be generated in the same way, but have slightly different semantics. It's kind of the same thing we're doing now. This moves into structure data instead of switch case in function. That's good enough for me. Vimi says, Lenzer, how about an equals 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 operator for your new language? What is, what would it be used for? Like <laughs> seriously, what would what would we do with it? Because we can always just A equals B is our equality operator. This isn't an assignment. An assignment uses this operator. So this is already an equality. We're gonna have like not equals, I'm sure. We're gonna have a lot of stuff, right? Lander XT says no, never, nine, nope. <laughs> so what would equals 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 do? Because what would equals equals do? This doesn't mean anything yet either. <laughs> Vimi says, but Papa, but Paul might not. <laughs> Marmite. Okay. I, st I If you can have an idea for what it would do, we will have it. <laughs> Much to Lander XT's dismay, he is so disappointed. No, N O. <laughs> so good. Okay, okay. So 
our footer, what will our program footer look like? In x86 assembly, well, first of all, we should probably do some stack things. So we're going to subtract 32 from the stack pointer. I think that's the correct terminology. But first, we should probably save our base pointer. I know we don't need to do this, but it, we're going to do it anyway. So when we start up, we're going to have a stack. And let's say we just set the base pointer. So we push the base pointer of the stack. So here, I'm going to need a little picture for myself. Sorry. Uh, okay. Yes. Right. So this is a stack or whatever. And let's say that the base pointer starts here. And it is currently the stack pointers here. <laughs> Vimi says, Papa, I have to come out of a closet. I wrote TypeScript yesterday. <laughs> oh no. Well, hopefully one day you'll see the light again. <laughs> so with our stack pointer, we have to save our base pointer by pushing it onto the stack itself which means that our stack pointer moves. <laughs> so now we get, uh, like the base pointer is actually there, the value of this base pointer one. Right? Then we set the base pointer to here. Okay. I think I can do that. The base pointer we want to move the stack pointer into the base pointer. And then we want to make some stack space just in case we mess things up in the function, right? Why not? No, we don't necessarily need to do this, but it's, uh, it may be to keep 64 byte alignment as well, because we push a that should be fine pushing eight bytes at a time so maybe we'll try without the sub r32 so then we have the base pointer and the stack pointer pointing to the same spot and then i think all we have to do at the end is pop our base pointer right oh. into rbp so ideally the stack in here gets back to normal and let's look at the code we generated. Okay, so we have the function header, which is here, and then we have here. So we save our base pointer, we update our base pointer, and then we pop it. Pop it, pop it good. <laughs> Lender XT says, get right back in the closet for a month. That's your punishment. <laughs> V me says, I can't. There's too many of mom's leather packed inside. Pop it. Pop it good. <laughs> oh, Christ. This turned in, like, into the binding of Isaac, but in real life. <laughs> so with our base pointer popped, we now have everything done. We do want to do this. And this is basically just a function. So... It may not be a bad idea to call it as such. So, a reassignment. Let's think about this as well. Hello? No type? So we have two variable reassignments. The symbol a gets assigned to the integer 420. Okay. 
So with a variable reassignment in assembly, we know that the data section contains our symbol. So all we have to do, all we have to do, I'm saying this is like it's simple. We have to take this variable reassignment symbol A in 420. So our expression, so we have a var ID, and then we have reassign expression. And what we would like to do is write a line that says, let's think about this. We would like the variable ID to be used in a move instruction with a dereferenced operand. Oh boy. So we would like to, and we probably should do rip addressing. So we should do dollar and then this is going to have to be the variable ID symbol and then we're going to have to have our rip addressing whoops for position independent code do I need this dollar? I don't think I need this dollar actually because we're rip addressing the express the assembly expression Oh, I forgot my syntax. It's okay. It'll be fine. We'll see it in the actual file and be able to test it. So with this generated, we can write a move instruction which moves this symbol we use to make a memory allocation up above. And we would like to write into it using... Okay, so we're going to have to write something on the left first as well, like that because we want to write into this memory. Also, do I have to like put it all in parentheses? We're gonna have to figure out how to do this exactly. Do we want to load effective address first? Okay, here's the question. Backwards left leaning arrow on 45th Street. I don't know what that is. <laughs> It sounds like a prompt to like an AI image generator. <laughs> um, so if we load effective address, we would like to load the address from rip based on our thing. Okay, so this would be more write bytes. So we'd like to LEA the symbol into some register. Is that right? So let's just do rats, the A register. And then we would like to move See, we have to generate this first. So we're going to need like a stack and a continuation or just do recursion. Nolan says, I've just loaded that sentence into an AI generator prompt. We'll share results shortly. Awesome. Great idea, Nolan. Lander XT says, neither do I, Lamau. <laughs> so we load the effective address of this symbol into racks. Does anybody remember Kali saved registers and stuff? I'm sure you do not, but I, I will ask away. Ooh, do I have that picture? Let me see if I can find it. Oh, I do. Okay. So, as you can see, there's actually a, a calling convention in C, which we're going to follow so that we can have interoperability, where each function, if it has to preserve the register, the CPU hardware register in assembly, if it has to preserve it through the function call, which means it resets it to what it was. So all these ones that say no, 
we can use these for whatever we want and whenever we want. But some of them are used to pass arguments to functions, so we don't want to take up those, right? If that makes sense. So you see R11 is a temporary register, so you can use that for like anything. RCX and RDX, you see they're used to pass arguments, and it's the second return register as well. So maybe RAX and RDX are uh, the good ones to use. But R11 is another temporary register. There's also ST2 through ST7, which I've, I have not looked uh, in too much, used to return long double arguments. So these are probably decimal or floating point. Hey, we got something in the Discord. Let's check it out. Ooh, that's very cool. This is very sweet. Backwards left-leaning arrow on 45th Street. Can I, uh, ease? Very cool. Thank you so much, Nolan. That is very sweet to check out. <laughs> Taking credit for this. <laughs> Lamal. Okay, let's get back to it. So we're going to use R11, right? Why not? So we have to evaluate this expression before we can do this, right? So we have to, to do evaluate reassignment expression and get return value. That way we can actually use it. Right? For now, we're just going to assume that it's an integer, that it's been type checked. So we're going to do some terrible code as far as our type system is concerned. Hey, oh, first time chat from a new viewer. How's it going, Glitchu? He says, What editor is this? LandRxD says, The superior editor. <laughs> How's it going, Glitchu? Thank you for tuning in. This is the Emacs editor. E-M-A-C-S, Editor Macros. It's made by GNU, and it's completely free and open source. It's been around for over 50 years at this point. So uh, if you like it, I would greatly recommend checking it out. So we would like to move, first of all, the number from the reassignment expression to do, fix me. This assumes integer type and is bad, bad, bad. <laughs> Landar XT says everyone lo should use Bing. Lander XT also says, Google loves to troll you by correcting Emacs to Vim when you search it. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Glitchu says, it's going well. I've never got the hang of Emacs, but then I had friction with it. Glitchu says, ah, the good old days of making a compiler. I definitely had friction with it when I started. But uh, all it took, once I, like, as soon as I learned Control N, Control P, Control F, Control B for navigation, I was like, Oh, this is actually great because one hand does lines and the other hand does F and B for forward and backward. So you can do all four. And I never have to move my hands. It's just I have a good setup with it. I think I was just, I kind of was lucky. And after writing the integer, we would like rats, this code up above that we just loaded our address into. We would like to load this integer at that address. And this is 8 bytes, so we do a move Q, but it doesn't matter. And if we take a look, we no longer have to print the node every time. Also, we 
technically should not have these. So we're just going to not do it. Good enough for me. Okay. Okay. Look at us. We didn't do new lines where we needed them. That's all. The fun part is when you write vector extensions for optimization. <laughs> oh, Christ. Like, I did that a little bit on my OS. I started looking into, like, SSE and SSE2 and AVX, and I was like, these make me want to die. <laughs> we have to ret at the end. Am I dumb? I am. Because, well, do we have to ret from start? Does anybody know? If we ret from start, we just get into nowhere, right? There's nothing on the, the, on the stack to point us to. Hopefully the OS has like a, a terminator stack frame, a null terminator stack frame. So if we ret from start, there's nothing to go to. Should we just exit? Like, uh, what's the best move here? I guess exit, we'd have to link already. We'll try ret. We'll just go with ret. Start would be called from the OS. It should call its main function. That's absolutely actually what we're doing. Start will be called from the OS. And the idea is that we're going to dynamically link with the C library so that no initialization needs to happen within the program itself. So we're just going to have externs. Right. That's the idea, at least. Okay. Twitchu says, hmm. I've done it before. I did some tests. Uh, I wrote Korth like six months ago in the same way. You can check it out on GitHub. All the code is there. It does work. So with this generated code, we have assembly, which we can then hopefully compile into something like um, code.o. Why not? Junk rip after expression. Yeah, so we don't need the dollar signs in the rip addressing. Whoops. No instruction mnemonic suffix given and no register operands using default for move. No instruction mnemonic suffix given. So that's like move quad word, move word, move double. Vimi says, I'm a fly away, my dudes. Have a good rest of the day. See y'all on Discord and streams to come. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming out, Vimi. We really appreciate you. And uh, make sure to say uh, goodbye to Vimi. He's the original donator, the one and only. He's so positive in the stream. He comes in here all the time, and I really appreciate his existence. So... Be sure to show him respect on the way out. Watch that ass as it goes, as they say. Anyways, thank you, Vimi. I really appreciate it. Nolan says, take care, Vimi. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Vimi, for watching. We will see you next time. In the meantime, we will continue our compiler progress. So it's saying that it doesn't actually know how much to move because this is a literal. We need to tell it how many bytes to move. So eventually we're gonna have to like actually think about that. For now, we can just use move Q because we know that we are using eight byte integers. So it's fine. And now Shell command succeeded with no output. Do you see that? So we, we called as, see the shell command down here. We called as, and it succeeded. Do you know what we call next? We call LD. 
and with LD, we have to link our object file. We're just gonna, we're on Windows, so we have to do, set the subsystem. This isn't important unless you're printing things. Ooh, I just screwed up. That isn't important unless you're printing things out, but it's, uh, it's worth it either way. Anyways, we want to compile this object file, and we would like to have it be a console application on Windows. That wouldn't be needed on Linux. And let's set O to code.exe. Shell command succeeded with no output. We'll look at that. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> so now we have code.exe. Whoops. So now we generate this assembly. <laughs> From this program, we generate this assembly, which generates code.exe, which we can run. And it succeeds with no output, which means that Rax here is uh, probably being set to zero. How could we set Rax? We could set it to a custom thing right at the bottom here, right? Before we return. Let's try it. Do a little custom assembly debugging. So let's just move 420. Now let's do 69 into racks, right? We want to see that 69. We generated this code into this assembly. And you see the instruction is there the opcode and mnemonic. I guess the mnemonic. Opcodes are variations of mnemonics, but it's whatever. We can then assemble it into an object file and link the object file into an executable. We can then run the executable that is generated. And it failed with code 69. Do you see that? We did it. We are, we are generating executables, the first executable ever for our compiler, return 69. Awesome, can we get a pog champ in the chat? So amazing. Thank you everybody so much for watching. We did it. We have executable generated. Pog, yes. <laughs> hey, it's the return code, pog champ, pog champ. Hey, thank you Glitchu, thank you Nolan, hell yeah. It's working, it's working. So we could also, we have this address in racks, or at least we should. I don't know if this is correct. Yes, yes it is. So you see these parentheses, the parentheses are effectively, okay, so we have like racks and that's just a CPU register with eight bytes, right? So there's like some eight bytes and all the CPU registers are like that. So when we access racks with the percentage, we just get this value. If that makes sense, we get this position here. So when we load the effective address of our symbol into racks, this value gets overwritten to the memory address where that symbol is located. Does that make sense? Eternal Wild Fox says, hmm, OMG, nice. PushQRDX says, a small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. <laughs> yes, yes, we're going to the moon. <laughs> no, but when we move this address, load the effective address at this expression, this um, symbol, into racks, this gets updated to the address. So, it gets updated to some address, yes. But when we move this number, this integer, into racks, you see we actually use these parentheses, and these parentheses mean take this, treat it as a memory address, and write at that address. So moving this number into the parenthesized uh, register, Creates, creates a, an address D reference. So if this was like in C, you would kind of write it like star racks, right? That would get the, 
uh, just across. And what we're doing here now is taking that star rax and saying star <laughs> rax equals star rax. This is kind of confusing, but what this means is that this address, use it as a memory address, get a value at that memory address, and replace this value where you originally got the memory address with the value you got, you read. So it's that. Which is a bit confusing that it can change, but uh, it makes sense. So then the value at the memory address here becomes the value here. And then we can uh, use that as racks. When we exit the program, the OS says, okay, whatever's in RAX, that's the return status. And 42 is the number we loaded into the latest global variable declaration. Or reassignment, excuse me. Also, shit, we didn't deal with uh, initialization here. So that's something to deal with, right? So in the dot data, to do, deal with initialization of global variables, somehow, right? <laughs> Push QRDX says, Lenser, moon coin when, <laughs> right? We're making moon coin and we're wearing moon shoes. <laughs> Glitchu says, all you need, underscore start and jump ret. Absolutely. This is our, this is our program. It's, uh, it's not impressive, but it does work. <laughs> no need libc dependencies or anything. Best program ever. Exactly. And if we wanted libc dependencies, you know what the really cool part is? You know what the cool part is? We can just add it. Does anybody know how to call libc from assembly? I've done it a lot, so I know how. It's very simple. So, syscall. Glitchu, you, you are incorrect. A syscall actually calls into the OS. So while you can do, like, interrupt OX80 after setting racks to, like, some syscall number, that is mostly used by the C library itself. That's the use of the C library, is that it works across all platforms, and you don't need to do this Linux-specific thing. Or I think on Windows, you would just do, like, call uh, create context or something like that. I don't know. But for the C library, what we can do is actually set up our parameters. So I'm just going to write this as a custom C call. Custom C lib call. So first of all, we need our parameter. So our first parameter on Windows gets stored in RCX. And here, we're going to do something interesting and have a format string, right? In this format string, let's have it be uh, LLD. Why not, right? That's, that's how we do things. So with LLD, we can then move this format string, the relative address of it, into RCX. So this loads the character pointer of our format string into RCX. So before we do that, what we can do is load into our DX, because if we look at our little handy dandy thing here, you can see that our DX is uh, used to pass the third argument. The oh, this is on Linux. <laughs> Never mind. Don't listen to that. That's a Linux thing. On Windows, RCX gets the first argument. RDX gets the second argument. <laughs> Nolan says, Len's throwing down some knowledge. It's true. I've worked with a lot of assembly. I am quite knowledgeable. But uh, I know nothing compared to how much there actually is to know. Because this should actually have like dot say proc and stuff like this. But I don't, I'm not good with stack exception unwinding. So I don't know what I need to do. And every time we change push onto the stack, we technically need to tell the stack exception handler. But okay. I'm just saying there's a lot more to learn than what I know. I am throwing down knowledge, but it goes deeper. <laughs> In any case, we can move some long, long integer into this. Uh, register, like 4269, 4269. How about that, right? <laughs> and then we can just call printf. Did you know it was that easy? That's all we have to do. 
push qrdx says it always goes deeper and the deeper you dig the more you realize you know nothing <laughs> it's true Ooh, look what i just did i hit the wrong button so then we here's the error so before when we would just assemble it into an object file and link it into an executable we're not linking with anything except this object file. So the issue becomes the linker complains and says code.o, the object, references this symbol printf, but the reference to it is undefined. We didn't actually link to any file that contains a reference to printf, so we can't actually do anything, right? Which sucks. And it seems like, oh, well, all hope is lost. But what the cool part is, is all you have to do is tell LD to actually link with the C library. This may take some doing. On Windows, the C library during runtime is the Microsoft Visual C Runtime, MSVCRT. Cannot find MSVCRT. Okay, so that's common. And if you have worked with the command line at all ever, then you know that to tell it where to find a library, you just have to give it the path. And uh, I think I know the path by heart. Uh, lib. I think just that should work. See, we definitely get some errors skipping incompatible. See, it looks like we have some backslashes where we shouldn't. So maybe in the what I wrote, I need forward slashes. No. See, it checks backslash and forward slash, so I didn't see that, but it should be fine. So let's go check out that spot. I have mingw lib I see. If I go to lib, isn't there a lib msvcrt? Dot A? Yes, it's here. So mingw slash lib should be what we need. Oh, you're using MinGW. Yes, I am. You can also use uh, Visual Studio Code. This is a CMake project, so. Or Visual Studio Regular, I guess, too, as well. Why does this not work? Skipping incompatible. Which is a very interesting message. Maybe it has to do with... I don't know, honestly. I don't know. Why would this be incompatible? Is it in the wrong directory or something? <laughs> it should work. It should work. Because there's a library in that file called libmsvcrt.a. Which means all we should have to do is link to this. Tell it where to look for it and then link to it. If anybody's, if anybody knows what I'm doing wrong, I'm sure it's very obvious and I'm sorry. So it searches the proper path, but it says skipping incompatible. 32-bit versus 64-bit issue. Maybe. Unrecognized option. What, where does that go to the linker? Yeah, see, so you have to do Interesting. I wonder if I have a 32-bit LB somehow. You have 32-bit MSVCRT, I think. Possibly. So let me see if I can check the file explorer. See if this don't get any easier. So as far as MinGW, I'm pretty sure it's the 64-bit version just based on uh, what I have. I have MinGW32. Oh, so maybe I need to point it to TDM. Let me try that. So I have TDM GCC as well on my machine. Does that have libmsvcrt.a or anything like that? No. I swear I've done this before. I've linked with MinGW in the same way. I'm just, uh, I must be doing one thing wrong and forgetting it. Because I've done this. <laughs> I 
Oh well. In any case, just because we can't get it working doesn't mean we never will. We can look up skipping incompatible for that error message. Whoops, hello. Compatible dash L, LD. Why not? Thirty-two bit and sixty-four bit compiler and library. You may need to install the thirty-two bit version. So, how do we tell the as to generate sixty-four bit? Because I believe I have the proper. That doesn't say anything about what bitness it is. That sucks. Can we do like dump machine? dash dash dump machine and then it says unrecognized what a, ki a killer <laughs> okay so if we check out as our version whoops see the target is x6864 w64 so we definitely have a 64-bit assembler i saw you had c minji 32 w directory does that help i actually had the c mingw directory. I have this as well, but it doesn't have the uh, msvcrt. If that's what you're saying. But I swear I've I've linked with this before. It's just uh, something I'm forgetting. lib msvcrt.a. Hey -o. Oh well. Nolan says, ah, okay, ignore me. It's okay. We all try. So, that doesn't actually work. Oh, no, no. You knew as. Yes. So, okay, we're possibly, let's do an object dump on code.o, right? So we are getting a 64-bit file from assembler, right? Definitely 64-bit file. So if we're trying to link to a 32-bit, that would be a problem. But I don't think we are. Because if we object dump, can we literally do C slash mindyw slash lib slash lib msvcrt.a We can. Ah, and look. Look, we did it. Chat, you were right. Glitchu says I can add verbose flag. That's a good idea. Thank you. So object dump tells us that our lib msvcrt.a is 32-bit. That's no good. So I must have just gotten lucky before in being able to link with the 32-bit on 64. Or I have the wrong, I just, how do I have the 32-bit MinGW installed? This doesn't make sense to me. Because I, I don't have the, <laughs> I don't have that. It's okay. There's got to be some other, uh, yeah, that's the libxac. There's got to be some other place I have MinGW installed. Because I, I'm linking 64-bit executables all the time. <laughs> that are full programs that link with this msvcrt so it's like somehow i have it somewhere but uh i'll need to find it he says you can add verbose flag do like gcc so i could do gcc uh verbose is that how i do it and then i would tell it o.s and then could you like not overwrite what i have gcc app.exe says dash dash verbose. Hey, look. Alrighty. Undefined reference to win main. Hey, that's a good start. That looks like static linking, but whatever. So it tries to do a whole bunch of things. Linking with Windows. 
which maybe we can do, but I don't think we need to do that. I think we just need to link with lib msvcrt if we're lucky. <laughs> so maybe I need the lmngw32. I hate how on Windows everything has the 32 after it, but it doesn't actually mean 32-bit. Like kernel 32 is the 64-bit kernel lib. It's so bad. In any case, we'll get here some, some other day. It's fine. I'd have to pull out my laptop too. I could do that and uh, I have examples on that from a few months ago when I worked on more assembly stuff. In any case, you can call it from C. As you can see, if we could link it correctly, like if we were on Linux, all we would have to add is, here's the kicker. If we're on Linux, we don't need any of this crap. We could just type dash LC, just that. And then everything would work with our printf and it would be glorious. But Windows is just this whole uh, shit show. I do really, uh, didn't I do a test like the other day? I didn't, yeah, x86-64 assembly, printf test. Look at this. Okay. <laughs> now, now I'm going to look into this. I was like, wait, I've done this. I forgot I did this like last week. Uh, <laughs> I figured it out. Well, I believe I figured it out. <sighs> it was uh, trying to enter into the C library instead of entering into our dynamically linked project startup. Nope, still wrong. Why does it say skipping incompatible? So we have a 32-bit library which this works with, <laughs> but this does not. So it could be the global, actually. Oh, hey, I didn't mean to do that. Could be the global. It's not the global. So you would think that me doing this, hey, I've done dot text. I've done, it's both. You have a no lab library. Go back to the readme. Did I really screw that up? Oh my God. It's both. It's both. Oh my God. Push QRDX, you just saved me like a long, a long time. Where did, okay. Oh, Christ. So interestingly enough, I have a 32-bit MinGW installation in my C drive that I uh, just didn't know about. And I uh, completely thought that that's what I used here like a week ago. So uh, I, I thank Push QRDX for saving us the further debugging in... Uh, finding this. Christ. So this is why you tend to write. <laughs> also, if I didn't write my build command last time, if I didn't write my build command down last week, this co this bug would have just perpetrated. Hey, 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 chat. <laughs> Thank you for struggling with me, chat. Oh my Christ. We can do it. What did we have here before? We're going to call printf. We need to move into RCX and RDX. RCX needs format rip addressed. Hey, 4269, 4269. Hey, I did the wrong thing again. <laughs> then do this one. Cannot find entry symbol underscore start defaulting to one megabyte past. Again, hit the wrong button. Cannot find entry symbol start. Well, I don't think that's my problem. <laughs> why, why can't you find it? Do I need to do this? Again, wrong button. No, this doesn't work. Very interesting. Let's hope that it works. I don't think it will. Again, I keep it in compile and I should just run the last command. And that generates code.exe. And if we run that, we failed with code five. We did something very wrong. I think uh, we don't need that, but we can use it either way. It doesn't matter. Okay, so we have a format string which is a zero terminated ASCII string 
of a format. That makes sense. We could also do this, but I don't think we need to do that. Again, hit the wrong button. Yes, okay. So I think we can just use ask is, that's fine. We have global underscore start, which here, let's take a look at my example again. We have global underscore start, underscore start. We do some things. Hey, look at all these comments. That's very nice. We even have a function call. <laughs> okay, so it doesn't seem like there should be that much of an issue. But whatever. So why would underscore start not be a valid label? I wish I was not so dumb, and I could remember more things. Undefined reference to assembly label. I don't think that's my error at all. What is my error? When I run it, we just get shell command failed with code 5 and no output. But if I don't run it, we get some out. Nope, no output. Okay. What am I thinking of? Well, I guess we screwed something up here, most likely. Sure, why not? Again, wrong button. Go ahead and undo that. <laughs> so we st now it says cannot find entry symbol underscore start. Wait, what? Did the warning go away? Yeah, it did, but we got it back. I don't know what changed. Uh, it says LD warning cannot find entry symbol start. LD warning cannot find entry symbol. Maybe it's a quote thing on the command line. So I'll put quotes around the underscore start. Nope, doesn't help. Yep, this is what I want. It says, it says you can't ret, whatever. I understand. Hey, Eternal Wild Fox has a syntax tree. Let's take a closer look at this. Hey, that does look like a syntax tree, a very complicated one as well. So you have token type, math lexer token private enum number. So each object has a type here and a lexeme, which seems to be a token. What happens if you get rid of the start flag? So no entry underscore start. We'll do it for you. Okay, we get we get no error. It'll try to jump to libc start. It should. And it should fail. But hey, it uh, it didn't call libc. It did try. It did do this part. It just didn't do this part. So the external call somehow didn't work. Do I have to do this, by the way? I don't think I need to do this. Again, hit the wrong button. Shell command exit 42 and no output. So printf is not producing any output. Eat the worked. Push code DX is saying eat the worked. It is. It is somewhat working. Just <laughs> it doesn't always work, apparently. Now it fails. Now that I've changed nothing. <laughs> Eternal Wild Fox says, I am having fun. That's awesome. So again, I am not using main. I'm using underscore start because I want to... LD looks for a start symbol in the files it links, but sets the entry point to the beginning of the text segment if it doesn't find one. Okay. So you're telling me if there's no start symbol... It starts at the beginning of the text section, which should be here. What? <laughs> I've never heard that, but it does sound right. It doesn't matter if you specify it, because start is default anyway. Exactly, I should just start here no matter what. Like, what if we called this a unique, something unique? And then put that in here. Right? 
dash entry equals something underscore unique. It fails with code five and no output. It doesn't quite work. So I wonder if we have some stack error for printf. And then add. Again, wrong thing. Gotta love it. Cannot find entry symbol underscore unique. So I've, I'm more worried that it can't find this entry symbol. What is going on with the assembler where it doesn't keep this entry symbol? Right? x86 64 assembly custom entry point. How do we not know how to do this? I feel like I've done this so many times before, but there's one little thing I'm sure I'm forgetting. Yes. Dash and dash dash entry equals blah or the entry directive in the linker script. Yes. If you are using runtime, then the entry point needs to be the entry point of the C runtime library so that it can perform initialization. CRT0, and CRT0 finishes initializing, it calls main. So, okay, we'll fucking, we'll go to main. Fuck it. Push QRDX says, yeah, I don't know, it looks good to me too. It should be fine. So we're just gonna try and bounce, we're gonna trampoline off the C runtime, is effectively what this does. It just means that our command needs no entry point. So we're gonna enter into the C runtime and hope that our process is able to be called. <laughs> Shell command failed with five and no output. Why? Why do you do this? We have stack space. It should be, if it needs 16 aligned, We would have to do that. Hey, something something happened. <laughs> it's not quite working. Is this backwards? That would be embarrassing. No, that's the right way around. I mean, this is a function header. There's no way around it. And then function footer, add pop ret. That's that's what we do. So we have an exit code, we have, maybe give it the good old remove everything and see if it works. <laughs> that is, that is a possibility, but it, it's, it's running is the problem. It's just not following this. So we're just going to, we're literally, ah, ah, we need to leave. Again, screw that up, but we need to load the effective address. It still doesn't work, but we need to load the effect of address. Again, that's how that should work. This just puts a new line. Even add and call a separate function here. See, this should totally work. We have RCX, we have RDX. Right? Nothing's crazy here. Maybe this number's too big. You mad about that? Again, wrong number. Gotta love it. Show command failed with five and no output. Oh well. So this should definitely work. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Because I'm pretty sure it's not that different there. And we're using move Q again, speed it up. Hey, that one runs. Shell command failed with code 42. So this, this works. It just doesn't uh, actually print anything, which is a very confusing time. Because that's how literally this works. Called printf. Leave format rip. Format is an ASCII Z. Is LLB. I don't even know. This is like it literally copy and paste it, and uh, it should work. We have just set into RDX, set into RCX. If this move Q is the problem, I would be very surprised. Again, 
one thing. Yeah, that's not the issue. This should work. We'll get there. Apparently it doesn't work. <laughs> but this program works. Our own program. I'm just going to put underscore start again. Do the wrong thing again, as we always do. Yeah, it works. Get the works. So then we're just going to go to the readme here and say to build generated x86 64 assembly on Windows source shell. And that would be this. And we're just going to say this is path to 64-bit lib msvcrt.a or something. And those under ninjw. And then there's to do is like on Linux and stuff. I'll have to open it in a virtual machine. In any case, that went rather well. We can now uh, figure it out. Again, I'm just going to remove. Uh, technically, I don't need that, do I? For the, uh, the simple one. And I remove dash L and dash L MSBRT and subsystem console. We can. Okay. We're going to leave it like that so it's simpler. On Windows under MG. MinGW. I think I'm going to keep it like that. Okay, okay. So now, I say we should take a turn. We go do other stuff. I feel like I've been doing code gen the whole stream. And I meant to actually deal with functions as well today, right? So let, let's deal with functions. We, I would like first class functions. So functions, I'm going to say this word a lot now. What does a function actually look like in the AST? Because kind of like variable declarations, they're kind of like variable declarations, right? In that they kind of need to be defined because there needs to be a function that you generate an address for in the, the generated code, right? You need to generate a memory address you can jump to for that function. And then that memory address you can jump to for that function, whenever the function is then called or applied, then that memory address is just jumped to after setting up the proper arguments in registers and stack and stuff. So effectively, if we have a function node, it would contain details about a function, but I don't know if we would ever actually encounter it. I think we can also change how the parser works slightly for variable declarations now. Where we don't actually have to set result to anything for the variable declaration. I mean, we can, but it's, it doesn't actually matter. In any case, let's think about how to define a function in our language. So I think we have an example that has a function. And it looks like we use the defun keyword, much like Lisp. So upon encountering a symbol, so we have two null denotations in our parser. One of them is an integer, which means that it doesn't take in any nodes, like any context, any nodes. An integer can just produce a node from nothing. Right? We take in nothing, a token, and we produce a node. Whereas something like variable declaration, if we can get there, somewhere, where is it? Where is it? 
So variable declaration, you can see it requires a symbol and a value expression. So this would actually be a binary denotation because it requires two nodes before it can be created. But actually it only requires one, so it's a left denotation. So effectively, our variable declaration is a left denotation because it requires a symbol on the left side of it already have that has already been parsed. And in front of it, there uh, may be more stuff to parse, but it'll return a node. So a denotation is just kind of something that returns a node. It can, you can think of it as a function. And this denotation is a left denotation. So we have a null denotation of integer, a null denotation of symbol, and if symbol is to fun, right? Well, then begin function definition. This is going to be a lot. So we're going to have a function, and it's going to have a return type symbol, right? We know that. It's going to have a, so a function has a return type symbol. What else would it have? I think it would have, well, we're going to need a list of parameters, right? And then this is going to be like a parameter, which was have symbol ID and so we need the type as well. Symbol type name. We have a list of parameters. Each parameter has a name and a type. We have a list of parameters with a name and a type. Yes. Then, okay, we also have the return type. This thing. So it may be, it may make more sense to do something like this in the order of children. But we'll see. In any case, after the return type, we're also going to need the body. So this is a program or a list of expressions. And that's just like our top level program, except it will have its own parsing context and everything when it is parsed and cogen context and everything when it is generated. Okay, so if this is a function, we have to build this tree from nothing. And the problem is, we can't expect defun. We have to expect this is defun. Right? Yeah, so we just have to say that instead of expecting this. I mean, we could, like, expect it before we get a symbol, but we're going to need this symbol either way, so... Well, we're not if it's the fun. Okay, why not? Let's do it. So we're going to move this up above here so that if we find the fun, then ahead of us we will have a function name. Right? And that's going to be that. And we're going to have to do a lex advance, I believe. With the current token, token length, and the end. So when we advance the current token, then the current token should be a symbol. I think that's valid. We don't really want to parse 
expressions as the name of functions. So we can move on. With our function name, we expect an open paren And then at some point, we're going to expect a close paren. But the, the tricky part is we're going to need to parse things in between here. Variable declarations for now. When we parse function calls, What's actually going to be interesting is we're going to have to kind of return back after a continuation. So we're going to have to have a stack, but that's fine. That is fine. So we expect an open and say, if it's not found, it should be like error prep or something, right? And say error syntax, expected opening parenthesis. for parameter list after function name. Good enough for me. We can just return that error. And put some, something very similar here. Expected closing parenthesis for parameter list. Again, I could probably do better. For now, we're going to do like a function name. And this is going to be function name. New symbol. Push QRDX says probably better to bake the conditional check into the expect macro true but then we'd have to prep every error and pass another like a, the error as an argument and then we'd have to make sure that we only ever use exp uh, you're right you're right you get better at the parsing okay that's separate <laughs> i thought that was push i was like wait eternal wild fox says should i do the syntax tree evaluation or should i try another parsing project to get better at parsing do the syntax tree evaluation, because walking a tree is very important knowledge on how it works. And if you do evaluation, you're one step closer to code gen, and then you've basically made a little compiler. Because like, turning your AST, Lamout, expect macro plus 20% better parsing. <laughs> exactly. Oh my. Folks. There has been a donation. They did not leave a, uh, a message, it doesn't look like. But they donated leet dollars. <laughs> they donated 1337 USD to me. And I very much appreciate that. That will go straight back into this stream, I promise. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't want to say your real name, but uh, I want to thank you a lot. Your name is... It starts with an S, and your last name starts with an F, so you know who you are, and I thank you so much. If you'd like me to say your name or don't care, let me know, and I, uh, I'll say it. But they donated 1337, and uh, I would like to greatly thank SF for donating. hey oh, we got a donation. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate that. I can buy... Little boy, I can buy a loaf of bread now. <laughs> no, but uh, I really appreciate that. That's very important to me, and uh, I'm very grateful. So thank you, and I hope you're enjoying. San Francisco? <laughs> it could be. Uh, that's the, the acronym. Not their acronym, their initials of their name. I just don't want to dox them <laughs> if I don't know who it is, you know what I mean? Oh, but I would like to thank... SF, so much for donating. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, I'd like to thank just everybody for watching. We've had a great stream today and we're going to keep it going a little bit. 
It looks like there is a message, but it looks like a hash. Like R3 V U Y X G G B G J O I H N I Z S B M Z 2 V Y B N P 2. Like that's his message for the donation. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly if that's a link I should go to or uh, what that refers to, but it's very interesting. <laughs> Eternal Wild Fox says, I vote for a longer stream. You missed one day this week. <laughs> I ain't streaming every day, bud. <laughs> we can do a bit of a longer stream. It's definitely going to be at least three hours, so it's not too bad. Why'd I have this open? Oh yeah, I was going to say Eternal Wild Fox. You could totally, like, from your AST that you have, you could totally generate code in a very simple way where each node puts its, like, because you're just doing math, right? So each node just has one return value, and it's an integer, which will fit in a register. So you can just have your return value always be in racks, so you can code gen the uh, bottom up, your entire AST, and just kind of code gen it in a literal way. And then from start to beginning. But then you could actually have, like, uh, compiled programs that do math that you wrote. <laughs> Very cool. Nolan says, a secret message? It is a secret message. <laughs> You're right. I feel like Nolan might have been the donatee. I guess I'm the donatee? Are you the donator? You're the donator. You might be the donator. <laughs> oh. So awesome. But yeah, I have no idea what that actually is. It looks like it almost... So it looks like a quadruple long YouTube video hash. You know how after a YouTube video it says like watch equals V7P1. You know what I mean? That random string. It looks like one of those, but it's really long. I don't know why. <laughs> but I appreciate it. 1337 from SF. It's a funny name, too. I don't know if it's a, somebody's real name, because the name is kind of silly, but I still don't want to dox somebody. PushQRDX says Monero wallet. Okay, it could be it could be a wallet address. You are correct. That actually is what it looks like a lot. It could be a Bitcoin address. Ooh, I gotta look that up now. <laughs> There's gonna be like one million dollars of Bitcoin at that address. I'm like, what? <laughs> Okay, so we're currently not parsing any parameters. Do we have like a little parse variable declaration helper? I don't think we do. All we're gonna have to do is say lex advance and give me the param name. Right, and then we're going to expect the colon, say, if not expected, if not found, and we're basically going to say, hey, parameter declaration requires a type. Good enough for me right now. We get a parameter declaration. Then we get the parameter name after once more like seeing advance. But this isn't the parameter name, this is the type symbol. So parameter type. And with this, we can create our little parameter node. Say node add child to the parameter. And I would like to add first the parameter type. I think the name, then the type. I think that's logical. So these allocated nodes are now owned by this parameter. And this parameter. kind of not our result. This parameter then has to get added as a child to the function. 
which we haven't created yet. So we're going to create a function name. Before we do that, we're going to have a node pointer function equals node allocate. Alrighty, so this function, we would like to add Oops. the function name to as a child. We would like to add each parameter as a child. Alrighty, alrighty. Pog, thank you so much everybody for watching. We've been streaming just over half an hour, or <laughs> over half an hour, just over two and a half hours. I'd like to thank you all so much for watching, sticking around, working on this compiler with me. Be sure to check out the Discord down below where we uh, hang out. We have all sorts of conversations. We have announcements every time I go live, working on this darn compiler. And more. We hang out. We help each other with problems. We're all friends here. It's a lot of fun. I really recommend it. There's also the YouTube down below if you want to check out previous broadcasts. And then there's also the donate button, which somebody with the initials SF, has already hit today. I would like to thank them so much. They give me 1337. That will, uh, that leet amount, <laughs> right? Leet. Uh, I really appreciate, and uh, it will help me greatly. So I'm grateful to every single one of you. If you cannot donate or don't feel like you want to, that is completely okay. Feel free to hang out and chat, talk, and do whatever. Watch, be entertained. I welcome you. <laughs> That's my little spiel done. So let's keep working on these parameters. Oh yeah, and uh, be sure to hit that follow button on Twitch. We are just like eight followers away and I will have Twitch affiliate. We will have custom emotes. We will have cheering. We will have channel points. It's going to be dope. I really recommend hitting that button. I really like the idea that that's like a Monero wallet or something. That'd be hilarious. So parameter, node allocate. So each parameter gets the two children, a name and type. And then that gets added to the list of parameters. Okay, right? So we're actually going to create a parameter list. Okay. The parameter list will have a bunch of child parameters. Each parameter will have children for name and type. I think that makes sense. And then the list of parameters gets added to the function. Also, the function name shouldn't necessarily be in the uh, AST. So I think this is wrong. Function name shouldn't be in AST, should be bound in parsing in context environment. Why not? Yes, yes. By the way, if uh, if there's ever a donation and you feel like you got, uh, like you didn't get shouted out the way you wanted to, feel free to message me on the Discord or anything, and uh, we can resolve anything like that. If you would like me to say your name or not say your name or say a different name, it's all good. Or not say the amount, but also say your name. Everything's possible. Just be sure to message me on the Discord. I'm flexible. I want to be sure that you feel like you get what you deserve when paying. So the function name, we don't actually need in the function AST. That will just be used in the environment so that in function calls, when it has a symbol, we can ensure that it's a function and look it up and get this actual function node. Okay, I don't think that's too insane. So I think we can just remove that. Function name. 
to do bind function name to function node in functions environment which we're gonna have to create look at us we could also just have a symbol table and each of these types could be checked at compile time but i feel like it's easier to just have separate environments and it probably makes things slightly more efficient uh speed wise versus memory wise So I guess I'm going to have a parameter list, and then I want to say while. Also, I should probably keep track of errors like this. All right. So I'm going to say while expect. Expected. Am I able to do something like this? Expect, expected, expected dot. Found. So while expected is not found, I would like to parse ahead. So expect what? We're not expecting anything yet, is the issue. Well, I guess we are. This is the expect close paren, and then all the expect things. So expect I guess this it really wants this to be an assignment. It can't just be an expression. Or I screwed up the uh, things, but I don't think I did. Darn. <laughs> so, all in all, we're basically going to have to say, do this at the end. Just say, wow. Let's think about this. Right? Do a forever loop and then say if this break. So basically, I think I like forever versus while one. Basically, while parsing this parameter list, we are going to be expecting a closing paren all the time. And if we find it, we're done. Right? And then we should say if expected dot done error. Right, this is going to be a big error because we're gonna have it's kind of it's gonna be where do I close paren? Where to go? Here. I think it's gonna be like that. expected closing parenthesis for parameter list. So if we get to the end of the file and we're done lexing, we say, hey, we definitely didn't find what we need to. There's also some other things we could do here, but that's a good start. That is a good start. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. I greatly appreciate you. How are you doing? I'm really curious how Eternal Wild Fox evaluation is going to go. What's the difference in a compiled binary between while one and forever? So while one is kind of uh, taking advantage of the fact that one is a literal and it will never change. So it's just uh, will always be true, right? But while one still gets generated as like a while loop, whereas forever there is no end condition, so the compiler knows that this is actually a loop that goes forever, whereas a while loop with a one in it still gets treated like a while loop and does the test every time, I believe, is what I think. But I'm pretty sure compilers are smart and they fix it either way. It's just uh, my preference, mostly. Nolan, to answer your question? Nolan says smart. Hopefully.
or it's dumb and it, this way is way slower, but you know, <laughs> that's what you get, that's what you get. But no, I've done a lot of work on the internals of C compilers for like Linzer OS, and I've looked around and I'm, I'm pretty sure while loops are uh, hard to optimize. So if we expect a close paren, if expected found break, right? So if we find a close paren, we're done with our parameter list. Otherwise, we need to continue on continuing on. And say our parameter list needs to grow so now let's just print node parameter list, right? Did we never print it? We never printed it. Wonderful. So we can go to example. There is a redefinition. Unrecognized token vfun. How did that happen? So unrecognized token happens here, which means that this fails, which means that we get here. Oh, and that just means we didn't actually return OK here or something. We still get unrecognized token defun. See, I feel like we should catch defun right here, should we not? So we get a symbol from the current token. Okay, we basically have to check the current token because we already lexed. This is a bit of a weird way to do things because we already lexed here. So we're expecting when we should be comparing the symbol. Okay, okay. So we're basically going to have to move this way up above everything here. I think that's fine. And then the idea would be not to expect, but if, I guess we have to do string compare, right? So if the symbol's value as a symbol is equal to defun, Begin a function definition. Parameter declaration requires a type. Well, we have types here. What's the issue? Expect closing paren. Do we, how do we get here? So we expect the open paren. And then we say lex advance. So we should have end of token after this parameter and turn into lex advance. Right? Sounds logical, doesn't it? Why not? And we get parameter declaration requires a type. A notation, sure. So what is this then? If we're not getting this, what are we getting? Lex advance and print it, right? Print token. Token. We get integer, integer. Well, that's quite interesting. What is integer, integer? Where is print token even defined? We just say the end of the token minus the beginning of the token. So just print the token. That's it. Just print a span. That's all we do. 
So in printing this span, we get integer. That's exactly what we need, right? So we're getting here, and then we get invalid syntax. So it seems like maybe this is what's happening, right? Okay, let's, let's see. So we get the parameter type, we get the parameter. So we could say added param parameter zero. Right? We get added param symbol a, which is an integer. That's good. And then we get invalid syntax. So it's likely we're lexing incorrectly after this because we need to parse a comma. Right? So expect comma. And we expect a comma because we want there to be another one. If there is another one, we can just continue. Else, confirm blah. So then we could expect expected closing paren, current token, token length, and, and this will make it a much better error message for the compiler. This technically isn't required, but the error will be worth it. Expected closing parenthesis following parameter list. I think that's fine. Turn it. Hey, look, we made it further. We have a parameter A, which is an integer, a parameter B, which is an integer, and then we have invalid syntax parameter declaration requires a type annotation. So the idea is if we did find it, we should break. Yeah, that helps a lot. So now we parse the entire parameter list. So now our parameter list, I know it's a little confusing with the none, but our parameter list is here. Each parameter is here, and it has a symbol with a name and a symbol with a type. Hog. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> so now we are parsing parameters. Now we need the return type and then the actual body of the function. This is a big old mess, ain't it? So with this, we have to do parse body of function, first of all, right? That's important. All right. Uh, I've been streaming almost three hours, I do want to mention. If you are enjoying what you see, be sure to hit that follow button. We're, we'll be an affiliate very soon. You can be a part of our journey. One of the original 50, OG 50. So uh, definitely be sure to hit that follow button if you haven't already. Thank you. And we will now continue. So we have to parse the body of function, but first we have to parse the return type of the function. Yeah, so the return type of the function is effectively, I really should shorten this to just use these all implicitly, but I can't stand hidden functionality <laughs> like that use macro invocations that use parameters that they don't actually take in are so ugly. 
and only usable in one situation. That's whatever. If not found, then this would be an error in that. To do, slash fix me. Should we allow implicit return type? So error, error syntax, function definition requires return type annotation after parameter following, why not parameter list? It's a little long, but it's fine. Return that error, and that looks good to me. Unrecognized token reach during parsing, integer. So that's actually our return type itself. So if we go up here to when we got the return type, we should make that into a little thing, like get type uh, helper. Um, parse type. I guess this should be off obvious by the name. So then we will say node add child to the parent, which is going to be the function. And it's going to have the function return value, or return type, excuse me. It'd be weird if the return value was built into the, <laughs> into the AST, kind of a useless function. In any case, that should be this return type symbol. And then we have the to-do to get the rest of the expressions. Push QRDX at Nolan forever plus 80% performance. <laughs> Damn, is that true? I feel like that number's made up, but it looks true. So I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to say you're wrong. <laughs> so what a function we just treated as result. Okay, so now no type func should be a thing. Also, these aren't literals. These are null denotation types. But it's fine. Literals is okay too, but this is better. Contains three children. One parameter list, which contains one it's, uh, name and type. That makes sense. So each parameter has a name and a type. Then we have the return type symbol. Why not? then three, which is the expression list program. Good enough for me. So working result is a function. There's places in here that we now need to fix. We also need to add the parameter list to the function itself. Assertion failed. Hey oh, node type max equals eight in node compare. Let's do a node compare. So I don't think we're ever gonna have to compare functions. So we're just gonna put this in here like it doesn't matter. Oh, we didn't update the assert, so it doesn't matter that we did it. Okay, another assert in line 218 in print node. Okay, so we would like to print out a function just by printing function, and then it's children. Oh, look at us. Push QRDX says true, I swear. <laughs> 
host man how's it going host man it's been a while since uh we've seen you around you could have been lurking but i haven't seen you in chat for a while it's good to see you how's it going host man what brings you into today's stream Gotta hydrate. Get that hydro, homie. Subreddit. Get them, them karma, them points. Yes. So now, our example. It's a little complicated, but it's fine. Our example gets parsed into this tree. This is our compiler output at this time. Yo, low-level programming. Awesome. If you like low-level programming, be sure to check out the VOD. Because <laughs> the whole start of this stream was uh, doing code gen. Does that make sense? So we actually are able to generate this program. And actually, every time I run it, I'm generating code.s. So you see that that program if we look at example, is getting compiled into, I guess it's not because there's errors. This program is simple enough where there's no errors for our compiler right now, but we can run this and uh, it updates this file. Like if, here, I'll, I'll prove it. If we run it, does it work? It should work. <laughs> if it doesn't work, that's embarrassing. Yeah, it should be, should be here. Ah, because I didn't choose the new file. Look at me. There it goes. Hostman says, I'm actually making a Lexer and a Parser for my uni assignment right now. Ooh, don't, <laughs> don't look too hard. You might, you might cheat. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's exactly what we're working on. But you can see that this program has a variable declaration of a and it's an integer and then this integer a gets reassigned to 420 and you can see that that's uh, replicated over here in the assembly we have an integer a it's the size of eight bytes which is a uh, our size of integer in our language so we have an eight byte integer and at a we load the effective address of a store it in racks and then we move into racks dereference, so the address that we just loaded, we load 420, a quad word, which is eight bytes. So we load eight bytes of this literal 420 into this memory address that we loaded from this symbol, which is exactly what this does right here. It generates these two instructions. And then you can see it does the same thing for B. And at the end, we use racks as our, we dereference racks into itself, meaning that the address that we loaded into ra uh, racks last, the A register, this is uh, still there. So dereferencing it gets the value that we just wrote there, which is 42, and we store that in racks, and racks holds the status code of the program. So then if we run the shell command, as you can see, and run code.exe, you can see at the bottom it exits with code 42. So we have our little program, it's, it's, it's starting to work, right? But now we're just getting into function definitions and stuff like that and parsing those, which is why uh, the example is now failing. But as you can see, it's beginning to work because we parse a function with a parameter list, a symbol a bound to, which is an integer, and a symbol b, which is an integer, two parameters. And then it returns an integer, so we keep track of that uh, type symbol as well. So now we have a function definition with a parameter list and return type. All we have to do next is parse the expression. Expressions, I should say. And to do that, I feel like we could use a continuation. 
but it's going to have to be a special type of continuation that keeps continuing. <laughs> right? So at the top level of parse expression, we parse a single node is what we're trying to do. But a single node may contain multiple nodes and it may we may have to parse those nodes as well, which means that effectively we can either do recursive calls or we can do continuations where we just keep jumping back up to the top with a different state, which is our style. As you can see, we have our little state here and then we jump back to the top with a different state and everything works out. So for example, currently when we encounter an unknown symbol and it's not defun, if we get a type annotation operator following it, then what this means is that the uh, left side, the symbol that we got, the unknown symbol, is looking to be a variable name. But to actually parse the expression, let's say that it's assigned to, so for this colon equals a uh, little shindig here, you see that to get the reassignment expression, we actually just set working result to reassign expression, this allocated node, newly allocated node, and then we continue. And every time we actually set a new node, you can see that we use working result and dereference into it. So this address that we allocate here for the reassignment expression actually will be written into following, even though the result that we wrote here is a variable reassignment. So the variable reassignment will then have the next expression written into its reassignment expression child. And the idea is similar with function expressions, with a body, with a function body. But the problem is, we need to keep doing this, right? So there needs to be some sort of state that says, hey, we're parsing a nested function, and what we would prefer to do is come back when we can and actually be able to uh, add the parsed expression as a child to the function, or the other way around, check for the end of the block. Right? So, we're going to need to save potentially our working result. Okay, so what's, what's the actual use case here? In a function, we need to parse the body. So the idea would be to update working result and be able to parse single expression. Next single expression, right? Into function body. That's doable, we can do that now. But for multiple expressions, we have to figure out how to get back here without using a function call, without using recursion. Of course, we could just use recursion. But if we don't want to use recursion, it gets a little complicated because we need to effectively check for end of function body. First of all, check for the beginning of the function body, but then check for the end of the function body. If not found, allocate new expression node and parse into that. If found, return function, right? If not found, allocate new expression node and parse into that. But once we're done parsing that, we are just going to return OK is the problem. So for example, if in our function body we have a or equals 2, and then the number 6, right? In this case, we would update working result to be this empty node. 
we would parse into that, so we would get this node. And then after we've done that, we would continue, I presume, somewhere here. Uh, yes, with the equals and working result. So then we'd get another continue to get the reassignment expression, right? So we already parsed a variable reassignment, and then to get the reassignment expression within this block, we parsed two. And then parsing into two completed this entire node as a variable reassignment. And we return after that because when we have a two, our actual null denotation, we return OK, do we not? We do. So when we get our null denotation, our basically our literal, the problem is that if there's more to do, we want to go do that. So if stack, so if there is more to do, go do that. That's what I said. I think that made sense. How does this actually get implemented? So update working result based on so I need to take different actions based on something. And I think it would have to be a node. So I'm going to have each parsing context. If this has a parent parsing context, hey, we got something in the Discord. We got B saying, please update Go, please, for an improved Rust, ex Rust experience. Lamau. So you have, you're writing in Rust, and VS Code is like, hey, get this Go language server. <laughs> Lamau. So awesome. This code is uh, terrifying to read. Like these little annotations confuse me because they're not actually in the file. They're just inserted. It's so confusing. It's whatever. Rust is interesting. <laughs> That's really cool. Thank you for sharing that. Alrighty. Uh, Hostman, if you're still here, what is your Lexer, like what's your uni assignment for? What's it about? Is it a uh, like create any lexer and parser or do you have like a specific goal do you have to create like a prat parser or recursive descent parser do you have to do an operator precedence parser which is kind of a prat parser i think a prat parser can be an operator precedence parser but it doesn't have to because prat parsing generally uses precedences for operators, but it doesn't, I don't think, necessarily have to. I could be wrong on that. So each thing in the variables environment is a variable with a symbol identifier, which is a symbol identifier. So this is type ID, and this is name. So we'll just, we'll have name and type like that. That's understandable. So that's helpful and all, but we're also going to need a node of the operator that caused us to grow our stack, right? I think this is needed because in this case, so I wonder if I even need this in the parsing context or if I could just have it within here, that'd be pretty sweet. So the idea to parse the body of the function, there is going to be this stuff. There's also going to be the fact that before parsing, enter nested scope with uh, parameter names bound to variables. Create parsing context. 
uh, create new parsing context as child of current find variables in an environment. That looks good to me. We got a lot of Discord messages coming in. Let's check it out. What's the difference between eval and eval AST? Nothing. Both are evil. <laughs> yeah. But for real, eval applies functions. Eval AST resolves symbols. Nice. So, oh my god. Okay. So you map eval onto the... Okay. So if the object your past is a list, you map, evaluate onto it and collect every single, all of them as a list, meaning this list gets transferred into a new list where the arguments or the, the children are actually evaluated. And then symbols are evaluated here, obviously. I just realized no one can read this, but basically eval, eval AST walks the tree and resolves all variable references. Eval applies functions to arguments. Really nice. <laughs> yeah. Very nice, B. Very nice. Alrighty. So to parse the body of the function, we're going to have to enter a nested scope. Because in the body of a function, to do, how do we return things, right? So in the body of a function, there's going to be expressions. And this expression uses symbols that were bound or supposed to be their parameters, right? So these aren't actually defined. They may be, but they're not. What is your next step? Well, everything looks like it works. I have functions, macros, variables, so I think I really just need to add a standard library. It's technically Turing complete now, but still useless. <laughs> That's the... Uh, I feel that. I feel that. So you can define custom functions? Yeah. Um, uh, a common first thing to implement in Lisp, I think this is Lisp, right? This has to be Lisp. If it's not Lisp, I'm going to be real embarrassed. It's probably not Lisp, based on this. Unless that's a, a symbolic expression. And he used array instead of parentheses. So jfunk arguments x, definition symbol x. So he uses f. Okay, so this is an identity lambda. So you can define identity as the identity lambda. I'm curious where the body got stored, but it's fine. Not really readable, Lamau. <laughs> okay, we gotta stop reading the Discord and actually do things. Yeah, it is. Nice. So, effectively, there's a lot of things we have to do. But the idea would be... So maybe... yeah. So... Because we have to come back, but we also have to have a nested scope, these both have to happen at the same time. So we're going to kind of conflagrate these two things and make them the same thing. So this operator Excuse me? Hello? Okay. If there's more to do, go do that. Here, let's keep that comment. And then that's supposedly I want to say if context parent does not equal null, context equals parent, right? 
So I would like to jump upwards out of the stack. If this thing is done. I could also just put this in an else. Remove return OK. And then have something after this. So let me just make sure. Unrecognized token. So if we parse an integer, we kind of just do it. Right? Else, we look for a symbol and other stuff. After we do that, so after we parse an integer, I'd like to say if the parser, nope, if the context parent exists, context equals context parent, right? We should be able to eat the, eat the stack is what that would be. I have been streaming for over three hours and 15 minutes. I would just like to thank everybody so much for watching. Be sure to hit that uh, follow button down below. We can get to 50 followers. We'll be an affiliate on Twitch and you'll, you guys will get channel points just for being here. You guys will get uh, custom emotes. It's gonna be amazing. Another thing, check out the Discord down below. It's very active. We got a bunch of very smart, awesome programmers in here. Everybody's positive, everybody's friends. There's no way to exit the ripples. You have to crash it. We get lovely uh, thoughts shared like that, <laughs> which is incredible. I accidentally made functions side effect free for the most part, and I'm just going to roll with it. <laughs> it works. But yeah, I really recommend joining the Discord. You can get announcements every time I go live. Just ask to join this group. And uh, yeah, feel free to come say hi. Join the community. And of course, as always, there's the donate button down below. It's not required, of course, but if you uh, have the money and feel like, hey, why not burn it? You know, you could give it to me instead. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But uh, I greatly appreciate any and all donations. It makes a big difference. I, uh, I don't have many sources of income, if at all. So I appreciate everything that you do. I think this is okay. So here's the thing. What do we do? Right? What do we do in this case? <laughs> I want to look at my C compiler really quick. Not my C compiler, my uh, Lisp, because I know for a fact that I use this design pattern. Hey, look, I crashed ClangD. Got to open Task Manager and deal with that now. Sorry, stream may lag. <laughs> a little bit of task manager opening woes. Go close Clang D. Wonderful. And we're back. <laughs> In any case, in this Lisp parser, I do... Is it in the... I think it's in the evaluation. Yeah. Okay. So if there's no stack, we're done. Return. But if there is a stack, see, we go on to do this. That makes sense. That does make sense. Because in this case, it that's exactly what we need to do. Okay. See, I just needed a little reminder. I did this a little backwards. So the idea is that our stack will never actually be null or nil as it is in Lisp, but our stack parent will be. So otherwise, what I would like to do if there is a parent is to call evaluate return value, right? Did I close it like a dummy? I did close it like a dummy. Evaluate return value. See? Yes. Yes. So evaluate return value takes the current stack and effectively 
figures out what to do now that result has been filled with expression or expression gets set to something new. I don't know. We'll see. And we basically say get the things from the stack. That's how Lisp works. If nil p operator, so the stack contains an operator. Yes, it does. In parser.h, it does as well. The stack contains an operator. And this operator defines what to do next. But what is this? If nil p operator, operator has been evaluated. I don't know what this means, <laughs> right? I think this means that an operator parsed. So basically, if the operator itself needs parsed into, OK, I think that's a whole Lisp thing. We're just going to do this for now. Oh, I don't. Did, does anybody know what I just did? Jesus, <laughs> that was crazy. Return value. OK, so effectively, we're using the same design pattern where we're going to have evaluate return value. It's going to taste taste. It's going to take in our context. It's going to take in. Okay, also, this is not how we do things. Uh, parse expert. So we're going to need, I think, the node pointer result at least. And then we could have operator, I guess. Do we need operator? Why do we need operator in the other one? Again, I closed it. I, uh, I wish I wasn't like this. So return value. Hey, look, I crashed clang D again. Close. Close. There we go. So an evaluate return value. I see, we got past expression. What is expression actually used for? Okay, so expression is actually what to evaluate next. Interestingly enough, result. So result contains the result of what has been evaluated. So if we think about this, hey, result contains evaluated expression. Eternal Wild Fox says, oh wait, I just remembered PHP connect callbacks, which I fun use nicely for my Discord bot. That's awesome. There's like built-in callbacks into PHP. That's very helpful for webhooks or uh, web sockets. I mean, webhooks are callbacks. <laughs> so this would be node expression. What else did we pass? I feel like there was one more thing we passed. Atom pointer environment. So in this, we keep the environment and the stack separate. But in this, I think it's kind of important to keep them linked. Or if they're not linked, the stack would contain the context. So the parsing context may move into a parsing stack, which contains the other data. Eternal Wild Fox says, I need a little break from compiler action, Lamal. Absolutely. You should go write like a 3D graphics or something like that. That's usually what I do. I change entirely. I go work on my text editor and figure out how to make strings draw on the screen, right? <laughs> Versus trying to uh, figure out what bits go where and nodes and trees. and It's too much sometimes. It's too much sometimes. I agree with you, Eternal Wild Fox. A break is often amazing. And it's, uh, it makes you get work done quicker a lot of the times. So we would like to get a node pointer operator. 
it's going to be the context operator. I'm not sure why we don't have clang D. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's better. So now we have this context operator. And what is this? This is something that will be set. So if the type does not equal symbol, we're going to have an error. With, I don't know, error type and say, this is likely an internal error, right? To the compiler. So hopefully this doesn't happen. So we're just going to say, we're going to assume it's a symbol. Also, this is not how that works. Eternal Wild Fox says, I really need to rewrite the code so I use classes for my abstract tree arrays. Okay, I really need to rewrite the code so I use classes for my abstract tree. Arrays are not fun looping. I wanted something cool to see. <laughs> I see. Uh, well, we could probably go like... I think I just did it. Yeah, here. Here's an OS that I uh, built from scratch. We're going to build it, generate boot media and everything, and uh, we're going to boot into the OS on a virtual machine. Is this interesting? Is this cool to see? Look at all that. <laughs> Did you hear the startup music? That was dope. <laughs> so you can see that uh, here's our my OS. It gets the current time. That's actually what time it is and what day it is. You can hold left click. Ooh, if you're not an idiot. You can hold left click and draw. And then if you press right click, you change what color. And it's just randomized for now. You can also type, right? You can type. You can uh, move the cursor around with the arrow keys. Eternal Wild Fox says, lol, nice. Nolan says, amazing. Thank you. Yeah, this is Lenser OS. This is what it looks like right now. And uh, obviously it's not great, but it is fun. And it works. That's all that matters. How's that? <laughs> huh? Not too bad? Fun. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta have the nipples, bright pink nipples. And then, uh, we'll be a, a little bit of an angry face or a little mustache. How about that? <laughs> But yeah, this is this is the uh, the OS. Most of what's happening uh, happens in the background, as with uh, as as OSs go, right? You can see that it uses 300 megabytes of RAM, but 300 of that is actually from QEMU itself. So when when this isn't a virtual machine, if you boot from hardware, this is only actually around 50 megabytes, or uh, five megabytes. I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. <laughs> this is around five megabytes because all we have is a frame buffer. But yeah, that's the OS. Hopefully that was interesting. And you can see that most of the interesting things happen from here because we actually have a process called uh, uh, the C library. Here, we can even, I think we can just go find it. What is it in user standard out main.c? So this program is used in Lenser OS. You can see it's not made for Windows. It, it's uh, major errors, right? But in Lenser OS, this program runs at startup and it actually prints out, hello friends, with a new line. Isn't that beautiful? And then it says exiting because this is my C library and uh, we call return zero, which means we exit and then we remove process two. So it makes a syscall to exit. So yeah, you can see that that's actually 
my OS. Hopefully that's interesting. It has its own custom compiler tool chain and everything. So I really recommend checking it out and it's got good documentation. I think you could be able to build it yourself. It's gonna take over an hour to build the tool chain, but you can download uh, pre-released binaries that I've built for Windows and Linux before, which I recommend. So yeah. That's uh, hopefully Eternal Wild Fox. Hopefully that was a good break. Hopefully that was nice to see. There's uh, obviously a lot to go through there. So pick something and uh, <laughs> go check it out, right? Or if you have any questions, let me know. Eternal Wild Fox says that was fun. Yes. Yay. I like when it's fun. All right. So we evaluate the return value. The idea is... Do we need to pass here? What do we have? Egglet, please. A context, an expression, and a result. So expression Here's the problem. We're trying to parse a return value. Is my little my little error there. We're not evaluating. So to parse a return value, we're going to need to set expression to something else. How do we currently do that? See, in Lisp, that's easy because expression, you actually lex into the AST. You don't parse, really. <laughs> Parsing is very minimal, at least. So, or the parser. The lexer is just part of the parser, however you think about it. Nolan says, next break, we can try to decode the mystery message. Ooh, that's a good idea. I still don't know how. I'd have to figure that one out. I guess I could start by just Googling the number, but uh, who knows if that'll help at all. In any case, our current expression that we're evaluating is just linear, and we advance through the tokens. Yes, that is how that works. So when we evaluate the return value, all we have to do is say, hey, come back here, but write into a new result. Hmm. So the idea, I wonder if this isn't a function, if that would be easier. Let's try that at first. We're just going to do this, because this is actually, I think, how I originally wrote it as well. Return something. So the idea is... Uh, parsing context operator must be simple. Likely internal error. Sad face. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> awesome. I don't even, I still don't know what that is. <laughs> okay, so effectively, excuse me, we have some operator in the context, which means that we are in a nested context, and there is more to deal with. There's more to parse within a singular expression, and we have to deal with it somehow. We could say if operator value.symbol because it is a symbol at this point. So we can sure compare equals zero. And if it is equal to, I don't know, is that the right way around? I know it doesn't matter, but I don't know which way I prefer. Pow. So if it's defun, then keep evaluate next expression unless it's closing brace, right? Is this correct? 
So let's say we reach function parsing here. The idea is to parse the body. So if we just let that fall through, we don't want to really go to here. So that's not great. But we don't necessarily just want to return OK. That's definitely not what we want to do, <laughs> right? So we could say context equals parse context creates with context as a parent. I think that's valid. And then in parse context create, we just need to do a little bit of this. And then in parser.c context create that. All right, and then we can say context parent parent. Now what's wrong? We can't return something. And in main.c, we have to create the first context with a null parent. And something is undeclared is the only issue. So if we return OK. Hey, look, we're back where we started. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. But we are making progress. So defun here, by the way. I should just add in that. You get no here, so defund. And the idea is that context equals a new context. We may just want to copy. OK, here's the thing. Default. So with the top level context, it's going to be a little different, I uh, realized. And the reason being that, so yeah, no parent. When we are searching an environment, I guess the idea would be to search the parent contexts environment as well, right? So I wonder if I'm conflagrating two things that don't need conflagrated. So maybe the parsing context and the parsing stack are separate. We think about that. Could we think about that? That would mean that we have like a thing here. Which has an operator and ideally like a working result. So a parsing stack, if it contains this, I know I'm kind of undoing everything I just wrote, but bear with me here. So instead of having a parsing context, see parsing context still needs a parent because of the types and the variables. Hmm. What if this is a bit backwards? What if this is backwards? See, I feel like I'm coming at a problem from two separate directions and I'm trying to meet in the middle, but they aren't. So what we're going to do is remove it all and try again. <laughs> so we're going to have parse context create be just like this, but this creates integer and stuff. Right? So what we have to do, yeah, I think we should have default create. Because then this will create parent. And it doesn't need to add a type. It can just have new environments. And then we're going to have to have like a parse get type, right? 
is the issue. So when we look up environment get, see, this should be parser get, because we need to get parser from all of the context's parents. And this will allow dynamic scoping. Not too bad, not too bad, right? So dynamic scoping would mean that our parsing context, again, not kind of not quite done here, but our parsing context from main.c is going to need that default create. I'm just uh, thinking about that. And then the idea is that we're going to need a, what are we going to return? Probably a node. Let's just do a binding parse get, right? And this will take in a parsing context, context, a node. So. I guess with get, we want a node value. Node ID, here we'll do error. And then we'll say node result. Again, I keep doing that. So the idea for parse get is that while context, context equals context parent, environment get so here's the thing we need to know which what we're getting so if this will be like get type we could also just have like an array or a map here we could have an environment that holds environments that's not a bad idea <laughs> fix me should this be an environment that contains other environments and environments and things that would mean that a node has to become an environment or an environment has to become a node but I don't think that's a big deal so return the error we need and when we get this we're going to do types id result. This is a boolean-like value. So int status. If not status, prep error and return it. Alrighty. How's everybody doing? Everybody having fun? Not doing too bad? We are, uh, Coming up on the end of the stream here, I have to go at least by 12.30, which is in 25 minutes. But I think I should go sooner so that I can actually eat and or go to the bathroom before I have to leave. So I'm just letting everybody know the stream is winding down. We are getting towards the end. I thank everybody for watching. And uh, please stick around till the very end. We can all say we love each other and uh, have a fun time. So this would be an error, I don't even know, and this says type is not found in environment. So when type is not found, I guess we need to signal that somehow, right? So we should never have a type of none. node none, what is it? Yeah, something like that. So we'll do one of those. Do I have to free this? I do. And I lose the pointer. So I have to do node pointer none equals node none. Free none. Look at us. 
So to get the type, search all of them. So I guess I'm doing this a bit backwards, aren't I? Result type equals no type none. We'll just do that. And then we'll say, okay, this. Right? Yes, yes. And then here, this means that type has actually been found. So all I have to do is set result. Well, we already set it here, so we're done. Right? All done. This we're just going to put here. Okay, so if we find the type, we just return and result is set to the type. If we get through all of the contexts, all of the parents, the type does not exist in any of them, then that means return none. All right? So now I can use parse get type on text, type symbol, type value. And I can effectively do a none p on type value. And basically, if this is none, we have this error. Who wants to bet that that doesn't work? <laughs> hey, it actually worked. <laughs> hey, oh, it worked. Eat the work, eat the work. We are eight followers away from becoming a Twitch affiliate. Be sure to hit that follow button if you haven't already and you enjoy what you are seeing. All right, so we get this type. Type symbol is used here. Then it's not used after this. So after this, we could say, hey, we no longer need type symbol. But we need it if we actually succeed and it equals one. So that's all protected. In any case, I think we're going to do something like this. Coolio. Okay, so the idea now, I forgot, I completely forgot where I just was. So if we have an operator here, and that means we have context. I think that's correct. So now, else, create a symbol. If the symbol is to fun, do this, else do this. Hey, but we got here. Everybody, we did it. <laughs> Holy shit. hey -o. So we are now parsing, but instead of returning, like we are in all these cases, instead of returning, we make it through and actually are handling this extra bit. It's still just an unrecognized token because we have no idea what to do. And it doesn't matter. But hey, eat the words. <laughs> Bug. So to do would be that. So in any case, we should have uh, made a git commit earlier, but with the function parsing, but it really doesn't matter. And the code gen. Let's do this. Let's do a little git commit. So 
change the example just slightly to remove the error. All right. I'm going to include all code gen.c. Catch the error. And without making all these changes, I'm going to keep code gen and this little readme. Oh, I forgot there's a, something we shouldn't have there. So I think I'm just going to unstage that last line. That's better. I guess I don't need an empty line. All right, that's perfect. So now we can commit this and say uh, code gen, some very basic, uh, I guess we did basic, not even basic. We just did global variable declarations and reassignments. That's good enough for me. Commit the commit day and the not the push or push yet. We're gonna leave all this stuff. Oh, I guess we could push it pushy if we're gonna leave it on the working tree. And we've push it pushy. All this code is now available on the GitHub live. Wonderful, wonderful. So if the fun then create a function, or at least attempt to. And at the end, try and parse the body of the function after parsing the open brace then we should say, if it's not found, so we also should, if it's done, we're done parsing, then that means, hey, we just have the kind of dangling function at the end, or if it's not found, and this means we need to say error prep, error, error syntax, and this is going to say function definition requires a brace body following lambda following return type I think giving a little example isn't too bad not the end of the world we should do the same thing here should we allow implicit return type? That would be interesting. So this does the return type. Parse. The return type, this parse function body. All right, that's a little more, that's a little helpful. So now with the function body, we effectively just create this new context and then we have to do all this down there, right? I think that makes sense. So we should set what? I think we should set working result equal to the expression child, right? So we should have This function has a return type, which gets added as a child. We're going to be doing a similar thing, but we're going to be saying the working result equals function expression iterator or something, right? Function, first expression, why not? So the expression is going to be nothing at first. 
is we parse past the open brace, then we're at the beginning of an expression, and we say, okay, allocate a new node, write into that node, but make sure first that that node is a child of our current function, which is how we did it, yes? Unrecognized token A. There it is. So then all I have to do now is say context variables, right? And I have to environment set within this context. And I basically have to copy. So I have to say binding pointer variable it. Let's do param it equals our list of parameters, right? So we need our list of parameters to bind each one. So our list of parameters is actually our working result, second child, first child, actually. So our working result, first child, is our parameter iterator. So this will have children, and each child, okay, right? And then this is going to be param it children, param it children, next child. So this param iterator is actually one of these parameters. So its child is its name, and its child next child is its type. So we assign the variable name to the variable type in the variables parsing context in our new function context. Still get unrecognized token A. I mean, that's fair because we don't really have A plus B parsing yet. So I guess I could do like A or equals 10 to have something that makes sense. Unrecognized token, close brace. That's much better. Look at us. Okay, now when we get unrecognized tokens, that generally means we had a continuation where we shouldn't or something, right? So then we got here, but instead of doing anything, we didn't do anything. So expect the whole thing. Expect the closing brace. And if it's found, we'll then break, return, right? I think that's the that's what we would do. We no longer have to say here. We still get unrecognized token close brace. So we parse an integer, which means that we're done. And after parsing the integer, we would break, but there's actually more to do because we're in a scope. And we parsed this integer into this node, variable reassignment node. But now we would like to check if there's a closing. So why did this not work? Print token, print token. Interesting. It appears that we are parsing in the open brace, which is quite interesting. That's quite interesting. I don't know why that is. So what have we just parsed? Can I like print node result? Does that work? So the result is a function with none.
So the current token, because we expected it, where is it? So because we expect this, then that means our current token is this, but the next thing we lex We evaluate the first expression and then continue. Hey, oh my god, that worked. For a second I was like, wait, what's going on? Pog! Can we <laughs> can we get a pog in the chat? Hey, and I missed a follow. Sorry, uh, we got a lurk follow. Can we get that lurk emote in the chat? We got PK1. Followed 13 minutes ago. Thank you, Peaky, for joining our amazing compiler club. Paug. Yes, Nolan, it is Paug. We actually are parsing a variable reassignment of a parameter within a function. This is so dope. And if the parameter, for example, was named even a func something that doesn't exist... Oh, and it still works. We still parse. We still don't know how to do function calls, right? That's still, uh, for now, this errors because we no do function calls. Also, we we don't keep track of functions. So let's, let's actually do part of that. In parser.h, we're going to need symbol name to function info it's pretty simple we're gonna have a functions environment look at us it's now in parser.c in the context create methods we would like the also i feel like i should just do this Right? I think that's a little more understandable. Whatever. I think this works. We're going to need to put it below. Because this is C. So now... This is the functions environment. So now these functions. Let's see, let's see, let's see. These functions. So in a function definition, as soon as we get the valid declaration with the entire parameter list. Um, set function find function to function name in functions environment. So this is going to be the context and it's going to have the functions and we're going to set the symbol function name to the actual function so this node pointer gets used verbatim so our working result shall be owned by the function. I think that makes sense that the function would be owned by the function's environment. And that the function within the AST should either be a copy or I don't know. I don't even know. I don't know if we need top level functions in the AST, but the function in the AST I do want actually because they're I want first class functions. No, thank you. Alrighty. I, uh, I really have to go at this point, but I'm having so much fun and I feel like we're making actual progress that I don't want to stop. I don't want to stop streaming. <laughs> 
So we set the function name to the function. And then at the end, could we like parse print out the functions? I don't know. We still get un unrecognized token. Ooh. Yeah, we don't need this little nonsense anymore. <laughs> Rohan, what's up? How's it going? I haven't seen you in chat today. He says, then don't stop. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to. But I have to go. I've got uh, things to do, sadly. Look at this. We're parsing functions. Function definitions, not function calls. But we're parsing function calls, everybody. Look at us. Isn't this amazing? So I think this needs to be a list like this. So we're, we're, we're slightly wrong. But Rohan, I, I wish I could take your advice. I don't want to stop. But I, I, uh, I have responsibilities. I have to go. And I should probably eat something. I haven't eaten in a, a long time now. <laughs> probably 18 hours. Which is normal for intermittent fasting, to be fair. But I don't do that. <laughs> Oh, so the, uh, not the param it, it's this function first expression is the problem. And what we'd actually like to do is say, this is going to be the function body, right? And we're just gonna allocate an empty node for it so that its children can contain the proper thing. So then add to working result here. So add to the function body, function first expression, and then add the function body as a child of the result. Effectively what we've just done. Yep. So now you see that this third child will always contain the entire list of expressions. Wonderful. So we have parameter list, names and types. We have the return type. And then we have the actual body of the function. And that is all within the AST as a first class function. So a function call will either contain this object as a child or a symbol, which will be looked up in the function environment. Paug, Paug, very cool, very cool. And for function calls, oh man, I can't do this. I don't have time for this. But for function calls, whenever I create the, the top level symbol here, all I have to do is look out after this symbol for basically expect a left paren, and that defines a function call. Alrighty. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. This has been incredible. I greatly appreciate you for just sticking around and hanging out. Even if you don't talk in chat, we love lurkers around here, and I greatly appreciate all of you. I'm going to go into a little spiel. Feel free to click away, but I would really appreciate it if you stayed till the end. Nolan says, thank you for streaming. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it, Nolan. You are so awesome today, so positive. I really appreciate your presence. Same with you. Eternal Wild Fox was great today. We had VMe in here earlier, the OG donator. It was amazing. We had a donation earlier today from SF, uh, who I still have not received any correspondence from, so I do not uh, want to leak any info. But SF has donated 1337. We got that leak donation today. How about that? Right? But yeah, it's so much fun. Check out the Discord. The link is down below in the About section of Twitch. And you can uh, come get announcements every time I go live, talk to each other, and uh, get help on any programming. Do whatever you want. Set up little coding challenges. We do all sorts of things. It's really fun. I really recommend joining. Along with the Discord, there's the uh, Donate button down below. And the Donate button goes directly to my PayPal which means that there aren't very many fees and Daddy Bezos does not get your dollars, right? 
So if you uh, have some extra money and you really enjoy what you're seeing, I would greatly appreciate any and all donations. They are very generous. Of course, don't feel like you have to donate. Just by being here, I appreciate you and I value your presence. Uh, thank you for everybody for watching. We have done it. We fixed up code gen today. We did some parsing of functions. We had an extra long stream because I missed a day apparently. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I just want to thank everybody so much for watching. Be sure to hit that Twitch follow button so that we can get up to Twitch affiliate. All I need is seven more subscribers and we are Twitch affiliate. That means we get custom memos. That means we get channel points that you earn just for being here. That means we get uh, cheers. You can cheer bits in the chat. That means we get subscriptions. You can subscribe to me if that's your thing. And that's the way you would like to show support. In any case, it's so close. We're almost there. Stick around. This journey isn't going to stop anytime soon. So uh, I just really appreciate all of you for coming out. Thank you. And goodbye. Bye, mom. Bye, dad. <laughs> Peace.